Ladies and gents, morning. Uh, welcome to the 14th of March Transport Forum, hosted by ETC, Electronic Toll Collection. We're privileged in being hosted by them. Thank you very much for your support. Um, Sarah Campbell soon will do an official welcome. Unfortunately, Kuni can't be here today. Uh, they informed us last night he's got a crisis, but Sarah, thank you for doing that. And she will obviously tell you a little bit more about ETC, our host. Um, Transport Forum is now 12 years old. Uh, welcome also to all the people on the live stream following us. It's great to have you online. Um, looking at our agenda today, road funding in South Africa, feedback from operators, 14th of March 2019. Ladies and gents, I'm not going to waste a lot of time because we're privileged in having Mike Schussler here from Economist.coza and he's going to do the MC work for us. I just want to give recognition to the other sponsors as well. Obviously, this event is for free, um, so we need somebody to fund this. So besides ETC being a host, we've got other sponsors, and uh, I would like to give recognition to Oricon. Oricon is the gold sponsor of the Transport Forum for three years. Um, it's all about consulting engineers, ladies and gents. We've got VIX Technology, the automatic fare collection, Chad is not here yet, not here yet. Uh, you'll see Chad later on, I know he's coming. Um, electro electro electronic fare collection, revenue management, um, actually monitoring your operation should you be in public transport, making sure that the money gets where it's supposed to go. Very important to make your city a smart city. Uh, smart city is all about proper management. Um, just for interesting sake, the 16th of May Transport Forum event will be hosted by Huawei in, in Woodmeet and it will be all related to the smart city and obviously technology and so on. So hopefully we'll see all of you there as well that day. It will be very interesting. Then we've got C-Track. Um, uh, it's actually part of the DigiCore group. Um, it's all about fleet management, making assets visible. Ladies and gents, should you not be Subscribe to C-Track and their technology. Your car, your car might be stolen at this stage and you don't know it. So they'll make sure that you know where your assets are. C-Track's been a gold sponsor transport forum for all 12 years. Um, we've got Railways Africa magazine, uh, all about rail infrastructure. Uh, worth your while to subscribe to this magazine. Um, and the editor, Philippa Fox, is doing great work. She's got lots of editorials, visiting a lot of people in Africa. Uh, and it's also great to follow on LinkedIn. So you can, it will do you well to, to subscribe to Railways Africa. We've got the WITS Transnet Center of Systems Engineering. Um, they're obviously from WITS University, all about systems engineering. They've got a special contract with Transnet to do systems engineering for Transnet. They're now the second year gold sponsor. We've got Brand Source, Jody Hake, communication specialist, helping us out with some of our communication. Thanks to Jody, to be professional as well. And we've got Kulula Work. Um, obviously, with this, uh, this uh, plane crash that occurred this week, we all know about the hike about the 737-800, uh, no, sorry, 737 MAX 8 um, aircraft being grounded by many um, airlines, including Kalula, it's all about safety for their passengers and we appreciate what they're doing. Because uh, actually the previous event, ladies and gents, they were quite excited about the new airline or the aircraft and uh, this week they announced that they're going to ground it, the brand new aircraft. So we appreciate what they're doing and, and Kalula is a gold sponsor for the first year of the Transport Forum. So the Transport Forum was flown by Kalula. Uh, they offer great packages uh, for the business sector, um, so it's worth your while, obviously, in the Transport Forum's website to go and have a look what these sponsors have to offer. So let's give the sponsors a big hand. <laughs> right, so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Sarah Campbell. She's going to do official welcome to us, and then I'm going to gladly hand over to Mike Schussler. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Um, as you can see, I'm not Kuni. 
Um, so unfortunately, Quinny had a very urgent uh, thing that he had to attend to at the office. So I'm the stand-in, and you can call me Cornelia. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for being here on behalf of ETC and the entire team. Really, the purpose of today is to be as open as possible, to engage and have a debate, to find solutions where we can. And, and from our point of view, we have people in the audience that are scribing and taking notes, and we are hoping to put this all together into a report that will go across to the DOT once we've finished. So I think the order of the day is just to engage talk to us, talk to the speakers, ask questions, um, be as open as you can. We also have um, a social media feeds that you can follow, so those are all up on the board. Um, and if you're too shy to talk to us here, you can definitely talk to us on Twitter and engage with us through the various hashtags and channels that we have open. So we hope you enjoy the day, and thank you very much from, from us to being here. Um, thank you to Harry for always providing such a great platform and all the hard work you put into it. And then, of course, to Mike, who's been with us for all the sessions and hopefully our last one as well. And, yeah, we just hope that everyone here enjoys the day and thank you for attending. Well, we're going to look at the road funding again, and this time it's from the operator side. Now, all the people that are speaking tonight today are not operators necessarily. There's people from the road freight. But we're going to start with the CSIR, Dr. Paul Nordinjin. Um, hope I said that correctly. And uh, he's been around, I think, for many years on the state of logistics and, and the um, place. So come up and so long, and we're going to quickly get to the slides here. I think they just need to be that one, and then five. I think should see everything. Okay. Have fun. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I work at the CSIR. I've been involved in various initiatives over the years. My entire career has been involved mainly with bridge structures and then heavy vehicles. Um, when Harry asked me to speak today, basically representing the road transport management system, which is a self-regulation project in heavy vehicles, um, I was a bit uh, apprehensive and so I stand here in a bit of fear and trepidation because um, I'm, I'm definitely not a transport economist and I'm definitely not an expert on road funding. But I will share some thoughts with you, which hopefully you'll find interesting. Um, I'll be wearing a few different caps today, um, but let's, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, I, what I want to talk about a little bit is the importance of roads, and in that respect, probably I'm talking to the converted, um, but I'll just make a few comments. Um, some thoughts on road funding, and as I said, I, I don't consider myself an expert. Some of, uh, probably a lot of you know about the road transport management system. I'll just explain a little bit what it is and how it relates to, or how I believe it relates to road funding. And then I'll also just mention about the Smart Truck pilot project and, and also its potential contribution and then a couple of conclusions. So in terms of roads, um, my entire career, as I said, has been uh, with roads. and. I think it's one thing to sit in a, in, in, a, in a room like this or to sit in front of your office and read papers about the importance of roads. Yesterday I drove <coughs> um, just over a thousand kilometers. I, I was at the Argus on Sunday in the Cape and then slept over the night before last near Leo Hamka, which is before you get to Beaufort West. And I make a point of driving long distances a few times a year because I sort of like to soak in the roads and also the trucks on the roads. And so yesterday I had lots of time to think about the presentation today and just seeing thousands, literally thousands of trucks um, traveling in both directions. And, you know, we don't know what's inside them. They're mostly taut liners or, you know, they've got tarpaulins over. And, and so we just see a truck. If it's a side tipper, we then assume it's got some sort of mining product in. But, you know, the, the amount of freight that's moving on our roads and the importance to us as, as consumers, it's just frightening. 
if you think of what would happen if the if the trucks had to stop, and that's one of the, the RFA's mottos, you know, with, without trucks, South Africa stops. The, but I'm also wearing an, a South African Road Federation hat. I've been on the council for close to 30 years. Saeed is here, you're the current president of the South African Road Federation. Uh, the International Road Federation's motto is Better Roads, Better World. And the motto of the South African Road Federation, which hasn't been sort of widely spread in recent years, is good roads lead to prosperity. And then there's that well-known saying by uh, J.F. Kennedy about the importance of roads in the economy. Um, in the context of the, the work that I've been involved in, it's very important for the economy of a country to have efficient road transport. Um, and the likes of Mike and, and Stefan will be able to say a lot more about economic impact, etc. But in fact, in South Africa, we have got a very high standard of infrastructure. If you compare South Africa's primary road network with many other countries in the world, we, we've got a very high standard. And if those of you who were at the previous transport forum where Lo Kahnemeyer from Sanral gave a presentation, he expanded on that quite a bit. Um, but it's not, about, it's not just about roads. It, roads are a, a means to an end. So you can have a fantastic road network, but it's how the vehicles on that use the road, that's very important. So we also need, we, we require, for, for, for transport efficiency, we need minimum incidents and crashes, including breakdowns. So whereas the point number one, South Africa scores quite well, when you start getting to the rest, we do very, very badly, which I'll talk about. Compliance with traffic regulations safety and security, efficient re emergency response, and then from a regional perspective, seam seamless cross-border transit. These factors are very, very important for the movement of goods and services around the country and has a direct impact on the economy. So the reality, um, we, we're very fortunate that uh, Sanrol is looking after the primary road network in such a, an efficient way. Um, where I think, I don't know the exact figures, but at least 80% of the heavy vehicle freight moves on that primary network. These are photos that I took in Mpumalanga a couple of years ago. Um, these are some Tanzania, Malawi, <laughs> Kruger National Park. Um, and these are some photos I got f from a, a road in Russia. Now, if, if you think about it, where would you go if, if the road network was allowed to deteriorate to such an extent? <coughs> and you think about all the freight that's moving on a daily basis. Um, this, is, this is also a bit concerning. <laughs> Fortunately, it's not in my street. But we, we don't want to go there. Um, okay, so just a couple of very maybe superficial com comments on uh, road funding. Road funding is obviously critical. Um, there's a general, what I would call general funding that comes from uh, income and municipal taxes and vehicle license fees, which are not essentially road user charges, I would say. But then when we get to road user charges, you've got your fuel tax, which is probably, in my view, probably the most efficient way of collecting uh, funds for, for financing roads. And then you've got our toll fees, and of course you've got the, the toll plazas, which seem to be more, a lot more acceptable to road users. Um, but then you have the open, roll, open road tolling, which is the big issue in Gauteng and in other parts of the country. Then there's the mass distance charges. So in Namibia, for example, heavy goods vehicles over 44 tons pay um, 41 rand 50 per 100 kilometers, or 41 cents a kilometer. That's the category above 44 tons, and they've got different categories for different size vehicles. And uh, in Lowe's presentation last, last forum, which I won't repeat, but he mentioned about the fact of, you know, the, the, the different sources of energy and electric vehicles. So fuel tax is not going to be the source of income for road funding in the future. That, that's for sure. Maybe It'll take longer in South Africa, but in other countries it's moving a lot quicker. So um, I think that 
we have to look at other forms of funding uh, in the future. And probably the mass distance charges is going to be the most effective considering the technology that's currently, the, d the development of technology, it's just, it's very easy to have systems in place. Um, I think Lo also gave a comparison about electricity and water and I added cell phone call time and cell phone data and, he s and he, I remember he said, how come, you know, people are prepared to pay for electricity um, or for water, or most people, um, and yet they're not pr they don't want to pay for use of roads. And I gave it some thought, this is now the thousand kilometers yesterday, it's part of that. And if you think about it, these examples, the, the, the service provider provides the infrastructure, but they also provide the mechanism, the electricity, or the water, or the, co the data. And if you don't pay, they switch it off. But roads is different. The service provider provides the road, and you as the user provide the means of transport, mostly, unless you're using public transport. So you get in your car and you go up your driveway and there's your street, and you assume that you can use it. You've never paid for it before, except un indirectly perhaps, but now if suddenly in your street there was an op a, a gantry, so every time you went up your road, your, your thing went beep, you, you sort of, you don't like that. And I think that's the fundamental difference between some of these examples that we use in terms of user pay charges versus the road network. It's there and you get in your car and you drive. And it, it, it's the, the traditional toll gantry or toll plaza rather is you stop and if you don't pay, you either drive through the boom or you don't or you turn around and you go home. So you say, okay, well I better pay this because I want to go to Cape Town. So you pay it. But when you've got this funny looking gantry across the road and something goes beep if you drive under it, or it doesn't go beep because you haven't got a, 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 a tag, there's a much, a much lower, much higher resistance to pain. Anyway, those are my thoughts about um, different sources of road funding. So why, why do we need funding? Maybe it's obvious. Um, I think there are two main reasons. One is to increase the capacity of a road and that's primarily, I would say, in metropolitan areas. And then the other is to maintain the condition of the road. So if once, when a road is built, it's got a life and you need to do certain sort of maintenance. And those, those are two main reasons for funding. So if you, for, for road condition, what, what accelerates the deterioration of the road? It's primarily, it's the volumes of heavy goods vehicles that the road's been designed for that, but sometimes the growth can exceed what was designed for, and then of course overloading. So overloading, we all know, accelerates the deterioration of the roads. So those, that input will create a need for road funding, and then congestion or traffic volumes. As traffic volumes increase, so the, the congestion increases, and then there's a need to add additional lanes or to upgrade interchanges, which was really what the Gauteng Freeway Improvement Project was all about. If you don't attend to those, the congestion or the condition of the road, you have a big impact on vehicle operating costs. So besides the increased investment required, if you don't, we all know, I think, well, most of us know that if you don't do your periodic maintenance on a road and your rehabilitation when it's time, you end up paying a lot more. So it's not a good investment. It's not good asset management if you don't look after your roads. But, um, so if you allow that to d decrease, then it's not only the increased cost that's going to be accountable by the road authority, but it's the vehicle operating costs, and that's probably a much bigger uh, impact on the economy um, for cars and trucks. And this was some research that was done at the CSIR and the University of Pretoria, Prof. Einstein mainly did this. Uh, it was a, no a number of fleets of, of trucks operating on different roads, and they classified the roads as either being good, fair, or bad. It was fairly simple. This is a few years ago. And they measured the actual repair and maintenance costs. And you can see there's a huge increase for trucks if the road is allowed to be in a bad condition. And this has a direct impact on the economy, on our, what we pay for. All these goods and services that we go to pick and pay in Woolworths or Food Lovers Market, wherever you go, it's going to have an impact. So 
I, I've just made some interventions now what I think can contribute to reducing um, the demand for road funding. I mean, we know we need road funding, but how can we, what are some ways of dealing with it? Some can be sort of more short to medium term and others I believe are much longer term. So as I said, we need to ensure, the roads authorities need to be doing their periodic maintenance and rehabilitation. That if that's not done, then the roads will deteriorate and it's, it's poor asset management. And I think a lot of the municipalities have experienced this problem. There's the movement of freight from road to rail. Um, I started my career in the railways. I'm a very, I'm a, an ardent supporter of rail, but I, I also believe that the, the movement from freight of freight from uh, the, the KwaZulu Natal Department of Transport have been using this sort of information to write letters to particular operators who are seen to be overloading regularly. And um, they have had some positive responses in terms of improved compliance. But it's just to say that things are not all hunky dory. This is a few years ago when track was preparing to do rehab in on the N4 or it's, what's it called in the EN4 or something in Mozambique. But you can see some of the overloads there are quite scary. Up to 25 tons overloaded on one axle and on a combination mass uh, up to over 50 tons um, overloaded on a combination. These are mostly carrying aggregates from quarries and you know 80 to 90 percent of the vehicles that they weighed were overloaded. And this is an example where you, it's a, a three-axle vehicle, a single axle, a steering axle, and then a double axle at the back. And I haven't got my I'll have to put my glasses on, sorry. But it's a, I think it's a, yeah, the, the double axle at the back, permissible mass is 18 tons. It was 46.5 tons. So the overload was 28 and a half tons. So these things exist. Then we've got the condition of our vehicles, which are sometimes not acceptable, but I'll get on to this. Um, so I, I was talking about crashes and truck crashes in South Africa are way above international norms. We have, uh, the point of these, these little video clips is that it has an impact on the road capacity. Um, sorry, just this. This was in Pine Town last year. <coughs> In fact, uh, just about every day. I mean, this morning when I was driving to work, um, there was a crash at a truck crash at Van Rienen, and there were some lane closures, etc. So. It's, it's sort of happening on a daily basis. Um, load securement is sometimes um, <laughs> lacking. Now, today, as I speak, there's a break and tire watch happening at Donkerhook Waybridge on the N4, just by Pretoria. And I've been involved representing the South African Road Federation in this tra two-day training event for a number of years. Um, you can see they've had 41 events. Today, was, this one now is the 42nd. It's about training traffic officers to do better law enforcement on, on trucks, particular focus on brakes and tires. And what's scary is that of the 738 trucks that have been inspec inspected, which is on day two of the training course is a practical, day one is lectures, um, the, the failure rate is, is 69%. And that's fairly consistent. It's, it's really, you know, Sometimes it'll be maybe down to 50%, but sometimes it's 100%. So it's, and don't add those numbers up. Someone came to me and said, no, that doesn't add up to 700, and this is just a sample. Okay, I'm just, um, and the, 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 the defects on, this, on some of the trucks is, is actually scary. Um, so I'm just talking about safety here, where you've got big gaps um, between the, brake lining and the drum, which it should look like this, so there's no brakes there. Um, you've got a case where uh, on this side there's no brake booster, so that wheel has got no brakes at all. You have wheel nuts missing, um, tires in a bad condition, and, and these all contribute to crashes, and as I say, crashes have an impact on road capacity, 
and road capacity, uh, th that in increases congestion, which ultimately in metropolitan areas will increase the demand for n additional lanes. This is our crash rate, South Africa's crash rate, fatal crash rate per 100 million kilometers compared to some other OECD countries. And our fatality rate on just generally fatalities per million, the av international average is about 85 fatalities per 100 million, per, per million population, and South Africa is sitting up there at about 280 something. So we all know that, the, the 14,000 fatalities on our road, and that all not only is a problem in terms of impacting families and family lives, and it's not just fatalities, it's all the serious injuries, but it has an impact on the capacity of the road network. So this is a typical on Town Hill in uh, Peter Maritzburg, where there's been a crash, there's a lane closure, and the trucks are waiting. So this is costing the country a lot of money. Um, okay, I'm going to skip. I'm just running a bit out of time now. Uh, the the self-regulation project uh, started with an overload control strategy for the National Department of Transport, and self-regulation was identified as a one way of complementing law enforcement to try and reduce overloading. And so we based the original work on an Australian scheme and developed a national standard, SANS 1395. Um, Essentially, it's an industry-led, government-supported voluntary s scheme that encourages not only transport <coughs> operators but consignees and consignors to implement a management system standard which contributes to preserving road infrastructure, improving road safety and increasing productivity. Now, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with a management system standard, but SANS 1395 addresses all these different areas. So it addresses loading control, safety and compliance, driver wellness, and general support. So driver training is a very important <coughs> component, route risk analysis, um, monitoring and managing speeding, um, and obviously loading. So this is a standard that's been uh, implemented in South Africa. Um, there are three key elements, and the original purpose of the standard was to preserve the road infrastructure, which was the first bullet, but in fact uh, the fleets that have been certified over the last, since 2003, their big areas of improvement have been with regards maintenance of their vehicles and drivers, driver training, driver health and driver fatigue. So the RTMS is about safety and sustainability and uh, when, when I say sustainability, I um, mean sustainability of the road infrastructure which is where it's relevant to this um, topic today, but sustainability of road transport operators to have the right building blocks in place that your business uh, survives, it doesn't go out of business because you, you're cutting corners, and then ultimately the economy. And it's, so it's really about managing risk, promoting compliance, and increasing productivity. So these, this is what the board looks like, I'm sure you would have seen some of these. And um, that's a growth. Currently, we just over just about 17,000 trucks, mostly trucks and buses, about 300 fleets that are certified. Um, I'll just give a quick case study. One of the operators, um, you can see how they're monitoring, and this is this is part of the RTMS is monitoring and measuring and improving. So you can see how their fines have come down over five years. Crashes have come down. Driver error crashes have come down significantly. Breakdowns have come down. So, you know, if you talk about crashes and breakdowns, you're talking about capacity of the network. Break, we know, all know about breakdowns on the N1 around Pretoria, Rigel Avenue. I mean, it, and truck, you know, it's just, it has a big impact on the capacity of the network. Their speeding events, 60,000 from the telematics uh, the telematic system, is there 250 odd trucks? Well, no, 200 going up to 257. 60,000, that's 300 per truck per year, and it's come down to 19. That's risk management, reducing the risk of, of crashes. And there's some productivity benefits, so in their case, they've, they've actually reduced their fuel consumption by 23%. <coughs> and that's largely 
attributed to good maintenance processes and driver behavior. So a lot of companies, and I mean, there, there, there are a lot of good companies out there, that's for sure. We're not for a minute saying, but there, there are far too many that are not running their fleets as they should. And they don't understand the importance, for example, of driver training. Here you can see in the forestry industry the, how they've managed to bring down overloading. This is now 20,000 up to 30,000 trips a month that they're monitoring in the forestry industry. And for the last three years, it's been between uh, 2 and 4%. It started off at above 30% of all the trucks were overloaded. And there's a similar trend in the sugar industry. So the last three years, it's been below 1%. This is sugar cane trucks. So the, the aim of the RTMS is we recognize that there's a high level of non-compliance, whether it's overloading, speeding, vehicle fitness, etc. And law enforcement has a very small impact. And this voluntary compliance is to try and move that bar over to the right, irrespective of law enforcement. And I think it is still, we still, it's still scratching the surface. 17,000 is very small compared to the over 300,000 trucks on the road but we're making um, some, making some grounds. Um, okay, um, this will be in three minutes, I think. I just want to introduce the, the Smart Truck Project, or PBS, and it's a, a, a research project, pilot project, that's been running in South Africa since 2007, so it's 12 years already, but it's been very slow in, in getting off the ground. Um, looking at reducing road wear, improving safety, etc. These are some of the objectives of this and it's based on work that's been done in other countries. Um, it's looking at the performance of the vehicle rather than the traditional prescriptive approach. Uh, there isn't time to go into details, but typically um, a truck is unstable despite prescriptive uh, regulation. So you see a truck here coming around the corner, um, over speeding, and that, that is a cause of various factors. And the performance-based approach looks at some of those factors which can contribute to a vehicle um, uh, rolling over uh, despite the fact that it may be compliant in terms of the legislation. And uh, as I showed you earlier, the, the, um, the crash rates in South Africa are way above international norm. So that's a baseline vehicle on the left and the one on the right is a PBS vehicle. So you can see the difference. That baseline vehicle is a legal truck for timber in South Africa. It failed this particular performance standard. Um, whereas the one on the right, it's, it's heavier, it's longer, but it um, actually is safer. What the point that I want to make about the PBS project is there are also performance standards in terms of roads and bridges. and we do an analysis using the South African pavement design methodology to see how road friendly is a truck with its payload. And the prescriptive approach doesn't necessarily ensure a road friendly vehicle. So here, and this is just shows you comparing baseline vehicles with PBS vehicles. And this graph is the load equivalency factor per ton of payload. What that means is how much road consumption does this truck consume per ton of payload that it moves. And these are all mining vehicles, and these are legal vehicles, 56 ton trucks. Most of them would have probably single tires, which cause a lot more road wear than dual tires. And these are the red blocks are all PBS vehicles. Some of them at Richards Bay Minerals is, are 185 tons. So a 42 meter road train, but it operates on the private roads but it's still a very road-friendly vehicle compared to some standard vehicles. So that's a way that one can use technology to make trucks more road-friendly and, and therefore reduce the road consumption and again then in a longer, more indirect way, reduce the demand for road funding. So this is just an example of a, a, a PBS vehicle. It's got the R it has to be RTMS certified. That's one of the prerequisites. And this one is containers exporting wattle bark to uh, Germany for sort of high quality paper. And then a mining side tipper. It's got the tridems with dual tires. And this vehicle does about 50% less road wear per ton of payload than equivalent baseline vehicle. 
This is a similar one for coal. And then a fuel quad, you'll see these on the operating on the N3. That's, they've all got abnormal load board sign on, on the front. So, uh, yeah, I think, I hope I've sort of shared with you some ideas from RTMS point of view on how one can reduce the demand for road funding, looking at crashes and heavy vehicle overloading and more road friendly vehicles. Um, in conclusion, I think uh, road funding is obviously critical for the future of South Africa's economy. Some form of user pay principle for funding is probably the most sustainable form of road funding. And then the, some interventions that I've shared with you can contribute to um, extending the road, the road network and the demand for funding. So sorry if I went a little bit over, but thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, the one thing I do know, uh, uh, Miss Olga Mashela can come forward so long. Uh, she's going to talk to us uh, about road funding from a logistics and uh, supply uh, chain uh, side of things. Um, And while she's coming up, I'll just say on the accident side of things, if you look at the margin or return, not the margin, the return on assets that the road uh, industry got in 2013, it was just 4% after tax, 3%. So if you reduce your accidents, it could be very beneficial. If you obviously increase them, you might be gone. Thank you. So I must just get your... Need glasses at our age. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> I'm 50. I must have my glasses. <laughs> yeah, everybody over 25. Yeah. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Olga, as uh, indicated or uh, introduced. I'm coming to talk uh, with regard to the impact of um, road funding uh, from the freight forwarder side or perspective. I'm from Bolengbontle. Let me just introduce myself properly. I'm from Bolengbontle Consultants. Uh, we're dealing with uh, compliance and um, uh, business leads uh, for transport and uh, logistics. We're also dealing with uh, research on uh, a number of uh, aspects regarding the, the transportation of uh, our goods. As uh, we all know that the transport is actually um, uh, the a vital uh, aspect uh, for our uh, goods or for our economy. Okay, let me start. Um, the opera the, the what impact has uh, road funding on our uh, uh, economy? Um, freight operational problems and constraints, those are the, 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 the headlines that we need to look at. Uh, the cost of roads, um, road, and road space and uh, conditions. Heavy, heavy loads do not uh, adequately contribute to wear, uh, to wear or damage on our roads. I'm just going to quote the aspect and then I will discuss them later. Okay, I'm going to read through. Uh, road congestions and increased heavy uh, vehicle accidents and or incidents. Inadequate uh, control of operating standards. Driver, uh, uh, train, uh, driver training. Uh, driving hours and uh, control of speed and uh, loads. Heavy goods and um, heavy goods vehicles exhaust uh, emission contribute to the city air pollution. Um, our prof has already touched on a number of uh, the issues that I have indicated on the uh, presentation currently. Uh, in that, uh, when you look at the uh, um, the models that uh, our country is using with uh, regard to the um, uh, road funding. We've got uh, your levy, you've got your levy, um, your fuel levy, where you, you're getting all your, 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 your funds for, for the uh, roads. 
you, we got our e-tolls, of which we, we really need uh, our e-tolls for us to be able to, for, for, for us to be able to move our freight on all the roads, that the, the roads, as, uh, the infrastructure is sustainable, and uh, 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 from the uh, freight forwarders, we're also able to sustain our businesses. When you look at the poor road, you, uh, when you look at the poor road uh, 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 um, conditions, it costs a, a, a lot of money for uh, freight forwarders to, to transport their cargoes on road. As a result, uh, CSI, uh, CSIR has once indicated to us uh, the, the high impact of uh, uh, transport uh, from the uh, forwarders side. What freight forwarders say uh, from the SMME's uh, perspective? No comprehensive uh, funding policy. Funding of roads to benefit, to beneficial, uh, should be beneficial, let me correct that, should be beneficial to freight uh, forwarders. Uh, fuel levy tax all roads users equally, irrespective of the fuel efficiency uh, uh, difference and uh, the different uh, freight is uh, a major contributor to our economy. Freight contribute um, significantly on our economy uh, than the ordinary road users like your cars and your, 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 your one-ton uh, buckies. Um, fuel levy and the uh, user pay models are punitive to the economy uh, contributor like uh, freight. Who are the major uh, beneficiaries uh, uh, to, to, to the road funding model that we have in South Africa? Buses benefit from road funding through subsidies, while other transport modes like uh, the freight and your taxis are really not uh, benefiting from the um, uh, road funding uh, models that we have here. Freight damage uh, the road network is compensated by its significant uh, contribution to to the economy. The reason we're saying that uh, um, the freight uh, contribute uh, uh, significantly to the economy is because uh, freight or transport uh, owners are the, uh, uh, the major drivers of the economy. In that, you're getting your, 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 your funding in three ways. You either get them from your levies, you're getting them from, from your fuel levy, you're getting them from the, or the government is getting uh, uh, the funding from the discs, and uh, today we have the e-tolls, of which when you look at uh, all the income stream that uh, our, our uh, road funding is uh, achieving, you ultimately see that <coughs> our infrastructure, for us to have a, a proper infrastructure, all the three are actually required, especially the e-collections. How can our government assist uh, with regard to uh, um, the road funding? By creating sustainable road freight infrastructure funding system. On this, what we are trying to say is that uh, for every uh, freight owner, For every freight owner, the subsidy that the bus owners are, uh, uh, the bus companies are, are actually getting, the freight owners should also get uh, some incentives with regard to the tons or the loads that they are moving on the roads uh, to ensure that uh, our infrastructure is uh, up to standard, is kept uh, according to what we are seeing today after the e-tolls, uh, 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 the, the, the Johannesburg, uh, or the Gauteng, let me say the Gauteng roads were improved. Um, from the operator uh, competencies and development of skills, um, when you look at uh, the operator competencies, we are actually looking at uh, uh, the small SMMEs with regard to how do they ensure that they comply uh, with regard to the funding models that are, uh, that are um, uh, stipulated for, for, for the uh, freight owners. You're also looking at the development of skills. 
um, whereby when you have a, a, your, your freight or you have your trucks on the road, our drivers are trained in such a way that they are able to foresee uh, the, 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 the damage or the incident before it can even happen. So with uh, regard to the development of um, freight management system, and uh, uh, the, the d with the regard to the development of uh, the freight management system, it will reduce the cost of inefficiency on the road transport in that we will have less uh, incidents on the road and our freight will be able to move uh, smoothly on our roads. And uh, overloading should also be kept uh, in that uh, most of the trucks that are being delayed, especially at the um, uh, way bridges, for them to offload the, the overload freight, uh, the, over, the overload that they have, uh, then in other ways, the, the freight will, will go smoothly on the road. Um, affiliation to regulatory bodies uh, should uh, be minimized to ensure compliance. The reason we are talking about uh, uh, minimizing the, um, uh, the regulatory bodies is that we should have a one a, a regulatory body. Currently we have about three regulatory bodies and as a result for the freight forwarders it becomes a difficult in that uh, the cost becomes higher and at the end of the day most of the freight owners are unable to sustain their businesses uh, through the uh, regulatory um, uh, bodies and uh, this was also requested to the Department of uh, Transport in that we were saying uh, from the, I, I'm, I'm talking this, uh, this was the research we did with the, uh, uh, the bulk um, uh, uh, transporters. So uh, what we have uh, uh, requested or we have uh, highlighted to the, to the department is that um, the regulatory bodies, they need to be uh, minimized so that uh, we can have only single or we should have a one regulatory body with all the uh, aspects of, of uh, uh, freight forwarding in, incorporated. Because when you look at the, uh, the logistics of um, uh, the transport and uh, the, uh, s the whole, let me say the whole supply chain, when you look at uh, what is happening now, um, you realize that uh, most of the um, transport owners or the freight owners, they have a challenge with regard to the IT systems that are in place because they need to keep up with the um, they need to keep up with the IT systems that are uh, the, the technology that is uh, being uh, put in place to ensure that they work efficiently and to ensure that they uh, even help them to grow their businesses because most of the small businesses for them to grow they need the support from the um, both government and from private sector as a result uh, the IT systems that are uh, put in place will ensure that uh, they, they grow within their, uh, they grow and sustain their businesses. I think uh, that is all from my presentation. It's uh, short and uh, hoping it was straight to the point. Thank you. gives us a bit more time for a panel discussion and we can go home earlier hopefully too um, and that way we all avoid a bit of a traffic jam I hope <coughs> and we save the roads and our own funding in the process um, yeah see you outside
Acting Chief Executive of the Road Freight Association. Uh, up next, are we ready to go live? We are? Okay. So the people, if you want to participate in a discussion or ask questions or make statements, you can go onto Twitter and uh, go to uh, or, or uh, tweet to at Etol Facts. What you can also do, you can do hashtag GP for Gauteng Province. Road funding uh, would be a, another one, and hashtag rethink etols. Uh, you can see what other people are saying, the people um, in the audience, and the people online. Uh, without much further ado, how do we pay for our roads uh, is what Gavin Kelly is going to speak about. And uh, uh, you can come. Gavin, thank you. That's done. Do you want a, want a big, bigger intro? Oh. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gents. I was just saying to a couple of people over lunch, I hope this next speaker is a little bit lively, otherwise I'm going to fall asleep. And then I looked at the program and realized, <laughs> well, if I fall asleep, <laughs> I feel sorry for you. Um, I'll try not to snore too loudly. Before I start with my presentation, I thought it's probably prudent to tell you who the RFA is. Quite often, we take it for granted that everyone knows what the RFA is, and the RFA is not the RAF. A <laughs> little bit of a difference. The RAF, the Royal Air Force, and the RFA, commonly known, I think, by some, some government officials as a Luftwaffe, because we forever bomb them. Um, so the RFA, the Road Freight Association, is not the same as the RAF. And we're not government-funded in any way. Um, we have an acronym RFA, and a lot of people think it sounds like CBRTA and CAA and SAMHSA. A lot of people have said, where do we get our funding? We are funded totally and completely until last month from Busasa. No, from membership. Uh, from, fr from membership and fundraising events that we do ourselves. So let's quickly go through that. Whoopsie, sorry, I seem to be pushing buttons as we go. Um, quickly go through what the RFA is. The RFA is an association, not for gain. So every dime that we get in or cent that we get in, we, we try and spend and we spend it on various things and I'll tell you what those things are. We're a voluntary membership. There is no regulation in this country at present that requires that you are part of a professional organization involved in road freight transport like there is around the world. That's a point I want to make. Um, we have currently 414 members, and that is corporate membership. Some of those members have 24 sub-companies. So we are a single membership entity. So, for example, and I always use this company, and I always want to apologize publicly that I use their name. For example, someone like Imperial Holdings has a single membership with us but they have 27 sub-companies, transport companies. And that would be the same for, other, for the others of the big seven. You've heard about the big five. Well, in South Africa, there are the big seven transport companies. So we're talking about the Barlow Worlds, the Imperials, the Unitrans, the Bidwests, the Supergroups. And I'll forget one, and I'll always forget one, and I get lambasted in the media. So please understand that our membership is made up in terms of large companies, large corporate companies. Some of those companies have overseas holdings, like Unitrans has. They very quietly say, Steinhold. <laughs> um, so we also have members who are internationally linked, and a lot of those members actually operate into Africa. So 414 members, which really gives us a figure around about 1,400 transport companies, if you add in all the sub-companies and what have you. As you would know, Imperial will have somebody like Tanker Services, Fast and Fresh, Zenogistics, et cetera, et cetera, to give you an idea of, of, and if you see on some of the trucks, they have the bottom part of the curtain sort of lifted up and there it says, we are Imperial. <laughs> okay. We represent 52% of all operators registered with the council. So we are by far 
the most representative association in the transport industry. And I use the term represented with council. An important point, because what has been happening in South Africa lately is this whole discussion, and I use the term discussion very loosely because people have lost their lives, this whole discussion around foreign drivers. And those who use foreign drivers are generally not registered with council. So 52% of all the operators registered with council are our members. We represent over 34,000 workers in the transport industry because we are also an employer organization and there are 60,000 employees in the transport and logistics industry in the country. So we by far represent the majority of workers. So on the bargaining council where the unions are represented and when employers are represented, there are 12 seats for employers, we hold 10 of them. So that's where the RFA plays in the country. It is the voice of the operators. It is the voice of the industry. No one else is. Now whether that's a good or a bad thing can be debated. One of the things we've been saying to, to the authorities in the country is that you need to look at making sure that an operator needs to follow certain requirements as they do overseas and be belong to an professional organization, not necessarily the Road Freight Association. Our membership categories, we have various categories, so you understand how we made up. We have owner drivers, and an owner driver is exactly that. He owns what he drives, or owns what she drives, and he or she drives that vehicle. We have micro operators who operate fleets from two vehicles to 10. We have small operators who operate fleets 11 to 50, large operators 50 to 150, and extra large, just like my shirt size, 151 and over. That's why I do abnormal loads. For example, one or two of our extra large operators operates over 9,000 vehicles. So some of these operators are hug with an E, huge. Others are small. Each and every member of the Road Freight Association, whether you're a one-man, one-woman operation, micro or extra large, one operator, one vote. So Imperial Holding has one vote. The same amount of say as a micro operator, owner, driver important concept. There's often this feeling that somebody like Imperial or Unitrans, and I'm using their names loosely, please understand that, can determine how contracts are done, how the industry runs. That is not true. We have public and private operators, an important concept. So you have operators in this country who will carry anything for you anywhere. They're called public. And private operators who only move their goods Checkers, spa, pick and pay, alert steel, those sort of guys, Tridem steel, you see their trucks are branded with, in actual fact, the business. Um, I've said that we're the largest representative body and we try to make sure our bodies are large too. What do we do in terms of interests of the freight operators? A number of things. We look after standards. We look after safety. We make sure that operating best practices are brought, exposed to the industry, and are then assimilated into the industry. I'm not saying all of this happens 100% of the time. We obviously are involved in legislation, in either fighting it, developing it, making sure that whatever legislation comes the way of our members doesn't destroy their businesses. And it isn't always only transport legislation. It can be any other type of legislation. We look after training in the industry. Currently, we're sitting at a point where driver training has a huge question. And very often, truckers are hammered for the standard of training of their drivers, but we don't train them, we don't test them. It's government controlled. So we're at a turning point in terms of that. We develop the industry, bring in new technology. You would have heard some of it, but a lot of the new technology is driven with our interaction around the world. Environmental impact. We've, um, you know about carbon footprint, you know about clean fuels, you know about the drive towards sustainable energy. We're at the forefront of that. Currently, we're piloting two projects in Gauteng. The first is electric vehicles. That's why you've got enough power. We're busy plugging our trucks in. 
And secondly, driverless vehicles. And people, <laughs> driverless trucks are not far away. They probably, that event horizon, as I was saying to someone over lunch, is probably 10 years away. What you need to understand about South Africa, we've got many faults, but we're at the cutting edge of technology in many fields, and this is one of them. That's why we sent Elon Musk across to the States. He could have all his problems there and come back with a refined product. Security of assets, you would have seen we've broken a huge hijacking ring in Gauteng two weeks ago. Hijacking is a huge problem. At one stage, our biggest problem was HIV AIDS. Hijacking, theft, is a huge problem. This gang we broke was called the Killers because when they hijacked, they killed the driver and the, and, and, and the assistant drivers. That's what they did before they took anything. And if they didn't want anything in the truck, the driver and what have you were killed. We broke it three weeks ago when they hijacked that SAB truck you would have seen. Locked the cab, petrol bombed the cab, and like the driver and the co-driver burned to death for beer. We deal with driver wellness, so we have clinics, we test eyesight. Um, what's the biggest problem in driver health these days? No longer HIV AIDS, it's now diabetes. Diabetes. Diabetes affects what? Eyesight. We deal with operations and then obviously we have social events. So quickly, there are three associations in South Africa, RFA, there's TASA, the Truck Association of South Africa, and then BTOA, Black Transporters Association of South Africa. How many operators in South Africa? Anybody can give you an answer. The last reasonable guess we've got is 16,000 registered operators to move freight for commercial means on the road, you need to be registered, and that's a minefield on its own, roughly 16,000. Not all are registered where your problem lies. 1.8 million vehicles move freight on our roads below the gross vehicle mass of three and a half tons. We call them buckies. They're actually called LCVs, like commercial vehicles. 700,000 between three and a half tons and 16 tons. 320,000 over 16 tons and 200,000 special vehicles. So that's the playing field we're looking at. Then we bring something in about paying for roads. I don't think we want to pay for roads. <laughs> I'm going to teach you to suck eggs at the very beginning, and that is why, why do we have roads? Then some alternatives, what good roads and bad roads mean to us. Who pays for the roads? So that's easy, it's you. How should we pay for roads? I don't know, you work it out. And then a conclusion. And some of this you've heard earlier on before, so I will not bore you with all the, all the detail. Right, why do we have roads? Well, very simply, we transport goods and people. And whether we like it or not, that is the major mode of transport in this country. We can debate whether it's the right mode, even the association and its members have had many discussions with both departments of transport, department of trade and industry, public enterprises, saying we cannot sustain 85% of goods moved in this country on road. We cannot sustain that for a number of reasons. And some of those reasons have been mentioned. We cannot sustain that. Um, and we're going to have to look at changing that. Roads support development. There's absolutely no question to that. So generally you'll have somebody go and dig a mine somewhere and you know, three weeks later somebody has to supply them with pickaxes and what have you and how did the ox wagon get there? Went over the hill, somebody else came along, started making a road and the development started. In move the people, in move the food, etc., etc. So it supports development, we know that. It opens up new markets. There's no question to that. As I said, I'm going to teach you to suck eggs. Just quickly bear with me. But most importantly, it's the easiest mode at the moment. And we're all a little bit jittery about when you go to get onto a plane and someone says, you're flying with a new 737. <laughs> and we're giving you a discount on your ticket because you're not really going to get there. <laughs> we'll drop you off and they mean it. Um, rail... Unfortunately, like many things, rail is a victim of modernization and technology. And I'll speak about that a little bit later. And we have air, yes. And then waterways we really don't have. Somebody sucked up the vol and the orange, or now called the kharib. 
Um, so we don't really have waterways. And coastal shipping, well, it's going to go a long way before we can get that up and running again. So roads, really, is all we have at this stage. We have been piloting something new. For those of you who are 21 years and a little bit older, you remember the enterprise had transportation. You put something there and it disappeared and rocked up somewhere else. Well, until we perfect that sort of thing, the only thing we really have are roads. So what are the alternatives? There's rail freight. And a lot is spoken about rail freight. And the Road Freight Association and its members are not opposed to rail freight. In actual fact, most of the extra large members of the RFA operators are not road freight operators only. They, in actual fact, are beasts called logistic providers or 3PLs and 4PLs and many PLs. And a lot of them, their main business actually isn't road freight. Their main business is now warehousing and distribution. That is the big business today. And you'll find technology changing in there. And I want to spend just a little bit of time there because that's the background we're actually playing against. Things are changing in South Africa at a phenomenal rate. I spent just on six weeks, uh, a year and a half ago in the States, going to research, um, while well on holiday of course, going to research what the beer was, I mean what the road freight situation was like and their warehousing, and came back here and realized, as they say in French, we're not that doof. I did an, an audit, and Mike Johnson uh, is part of, of, a, of a scheme, scheme's the wrong word, eh, Mike, part of a program called the Logistic Achievers Awards, where we go around and have a look at what people are doing in logistics, and you walk into warehouses, and you suddenly find that you're at a thing called Event Horizon. 10,000 square meter warehouse has 8 or 12 employees. The rest, and I never know, Afrikaans, is or are, are drones, automated picking systems. The number of incorrect pickings, the number of theft between warehouse door and truck door suddenly drops to point something percent. It's no longer 30% or 40%. So that means automated trucks are coming, loading systems are coming, um, and rail freight basically has been caught with its pants down a long time ago already. Just like rail freight caught canals with its pants down. So rail freight, railways, replaced waterways, etc., etc. So the alternatives of rail freight is not a short-term thing. And I think you'll hear Transnet, well, not the 11 Oaks who left suddenly last week, but Transnet will start quoting figures that go into the billions to try and fix what we have. Now, those of you who are also just over 21 in the really bad old days, remember you went to the border by train. By the end of that, you were being flown. Now, I'm not saying going to the border was good. What I'm saying is that's how technology changes. And that's what rail has to do. It has to come up with a process to ensure that freight is delivered on time and reliability. I've spoken about sea freight and air freight and, and what their challenges are. The reality is that to develop rail freight or an alternative is going to be expensive in the short term. And we don't really have that money right now. And maybe... Maybe in the long term, it'll be cheaper. Paul spoke a bit about, and he showed you some pictures of how the Kruger National Park is, is expanding, getting water holes along the way to the Kruger Park on the roads. Good roads and bad roads, an important thing if 85% of our goods are traveling by road. So obviously, if you have a bad road, the time of travel along that road is affected. And road freight works on the basis of return loads, of keeping the wheels moving. So if you're stuck in a pothole where half your truck is under and you need to get it out, it costs money. You saw a picture of those trucks banked up on the N3 a couple of years ago. That's an old picture. Unfortunately, it might be an old picture, but it happens all too often regularly on many of our routes. So the duration of time and freight transport port works on a thing called just-in-time. You know, like all the oaks when you went to your wedding, you got the 
just in time. Works like that. Why does it work like that? Because the cost of warehousing and storage is incredibly expensive. Incredibly expensive. And to keep large amounts of, of commodities or goods is also expensive. Bottom line of your balance sheet. Damage to vehicle. You would have seen some figures that on a bad road, your maintenance can increase by 120, 150%. When you hit a pothole with your car, you've only got four wheels. I'm not counting the steering wheel, the flywheel, and the spare wheel. You've got four wheels on the road. And if you hit a pothole, if you're really unlucky, you take out two wheels on one side. If you're really unlucky. If you do that with a truck on a good enough pothole, if you know what I mean, a serious pothole, you can take out nine wheels on one side and a good tire. Not one of these, and I'm going to use the general term, oriental tires. A good tire will cost you six to seven thousand rand. A good tire. You can spend a lot more, obviously. Horses for courses. And then if you've got this wonderful rig with mag wheels, there go your rims. Okay, so damage to vehicle. And a large, a vast majority of running expenses is keeping vehicles roadworthy. And you will hear stories about brake and tire watching, what have you. You can drive a vehicle out of a depot, a brand new one, and I will find a road worthy fault with it. So, good roads means damage to vehicles is kept down. Maintenance intervals. Obviously, you'll hear guys will say they'll do a trip from Gauteng down to, and I'm picking a province, and please, it's not because I don't like the province. Take a drive down to the Eastern Cape, come back, and that vehicle has to go into a workshop to be sorted out. Alignment, all those sorts of things, because the roads aren't as good in certain parts of that province, and in Limpopo, etc., etc. So, good roads minimize your maintenance levels and if your vehicle is standing in a yard being maintained costs you bucks those wheels have to keep moving you're talking about an investment on a vehicle of nothing less than three and a half bar three and a half million service that i mean if you've bought a tt this year you'll know what the price is i mean a toyota tear is not an audi tt just go and buy a tt didn't you know that's what it's called it's like we buy our clothes at AC Kerman's. Sounds better than Ackerman's. Um, <laughs> if you go and buy a little vehicle like that, work out what the monthly payment is. Now turn around and work out a monthly payment on something that's three and a half million. Before you've started maintaining it, before your driver has not seen the pothole and wiped out 18 tires and alignment and stub axles and somebody else hasn't bashed into it, it hasn't got stolen, you know what I'm talking about. Increase in safety risk. We are unfortunately at a point in this country, if you stop on the side of a road with a freight vehicle, it's like standing, going on a picnic and putting your food down next to an ant's nest. Doesn't matter where the ants come from, they just rock up and they strip it, literally. You can imagine what it's like cross-border. You literally go, have a breakdown, go back to pick up the truck and it's literally the chassis that's there, nothing else if they haven't recycled the chassis. Loss of markets. We are at a stage in our development as a country where we have to turn this economy around. We are currently losing the status of gateway to Africa. Whether you like it or not. And I've got a couple of suggestions and I said them at a, at a meeting the other day and people looking with eyes like this. How do we stop all the freight going through, going through uh, Namibia and through Mozambique? I said, easy, sink ships in the harbor. That'll take them some time to clear that. But loss of markets, if our roads are not good, if we cannot turn around and get stuff to market or from the supplier and uh, turn the goods into sellable goods and out, we have a problem. And then obviously, development, development, development. The only way we're going to grow the economy is development. So the roads need to be able to support that. Now let's get to what this is about. And I'm not speaking about the e-tolls and karting. That's not a discussion. I'm talking about paying for the roads. Common parlance is tolling. So who pays? You see it, I said it earlier on. You pay. It's a user pay. And what they mean by user pay, it's actually an abbreviation for use owes pay. Use owes pay. Why am I saying that? Because quite often there's almost this belief that, that the roads come from Venus and the truckers come from Mars. And it doesn't matter how much we charge them, it won't affect us. That's not true. You all know that at the end of the day, as you see in the second point, it's the consumer that pays. 
It's the user of the infrastructure, and you would have heard comments about that earlier on, who pays the initial fee for the use thereof. But at the end of the day, we all pay. That's an important concept. So what we are saying is, how do we pay? First of all, we need to use the easiest means possible. And there are some examples. And the common example is this GFIP e-tolling thing. That doesn't seem to be the easiest way. You must use the easiest way, sir. Secondly, the least added admin cost. And there have been a number of shoutings backwards and forwards about how much does it cost to collect a RAND on the system. Surely we want to have the cheapest way of collecting that RAND. And please, I'm not knocking any system, giving you some pointers. We want the greatest possible net. If everybody contributes to it in some way, then everybody will pay less. If you have a very small ring-fenced market to pay, the cost will be more. We would like that fund to be protected. So whatever goes in through a tolling system, whether it's through fuel, whether it's through every single tin of beer you buy, whether it's how many times you visit your squirn mar, so there will be no funds coming in there, whatever the case may be, it needs to go into a protected fund that is kept solely for, for looking after the roads. And then it needs to be a fair levy system based on sound scientific reasoning. There's a lot of unhappiness around that. So, in conclusion, truckers in South Africa say we require good roads. We are not opposed to tolling. In actual fact, I'm sure some people in the room will tell you that the truckers are paying their tolls. There are some who don't. There are always those who don't. But we require good roads for all the reasons you've heard this morning and for the reasons that, that I've stated. You require a stable system to be able to calculate the true cost to the customer. This isn't an arbitrary thing. Well, we're going via Fentersburg, and I don't exactly know where that are, so I'll add another thousand rand for that route. So you need a stable system uniformly around that you can calculate true cost. This is a cutthroat industry. There are guys who will quote you two and a half thousand rand to move a container from Durban to City D. That doesn't even pay your fuel. How does it pay your tolls? How does it pay the driver? How does it pay the maintenance? The RFA has a thing called a cost schedule where we have 18 different cost variables of the different types of trucks that are in, in operation in South Africa. And we tell members, and it's open, you can purchase it, what you should more or less be looking at in terms of your tariff. This is not to set a rate. It gives you the idea of what you'd pay a driver, what you'd pay for maintenance, what you'd pay for fuel, what you'd pay for tolls, licensing. And the guys are asking amounts that just could not sustain it. We need a fund protected from abuse. So, you know, the Royal Air Force can't get its hands in there. This is for roads and for roads only. As they say in French, that is for pyre and net pyre. In English, it all for roads and roads only. We support fair tolls. No argument. We support good roads. We are prepared to pay for it. As a country, we need to pay, to pay for it. It's just really how we're going to do it. So that's really it, ladies and gents. Against that background, we know we cannot sustain 85% of the freight on the road. That's one thing we have to look at. And secondly, we all agree, all the freight operators agree, that we do need to pay for good roads. We just need to come up with a system that is fair and doesn't cost more to collect than it is in what we need. Thank you, ladies and gents. Just remember, at this stage, if we don't have trucks, South Africa stops. If we don't have roads, the trucks stop. And I don't mean we entertainment is found every night. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gavin. Uh, our favorite professor, Professor Steve and um, Stefan Kreisman is coming up and uh, I'm sure you'll find him just as entertaining and um, he'll have a lot more fun. He's bringing his presentation here on the sly, so we'll let him do that. Um, right 
perhaps just uh, the thing um, about these sort of ducks flying is that out there in the van with the ducks in it, and it's got uh, a few interesting questions. Fine. Okay, um, favorite, uh, that's not what they call me, a varsity. Mm -hmm. um, I will uh, talk today about a system, a fair uh, road user charging system that, that we are trying to implement in Stellenbosch and that we've been running for the past 12 months. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to tell you about the local switch ups. There's, of course, ethical issues. But I can explain to you um, uh, the, the proof of file that we did. It's called Drive a Distance-Based Road User Charge Voluntary Experiment. There's even an, uh, a website where you can log on, etc. cetera. Um, we do hide the website. Of course, we don't want it to be open. Uh, it is still in testing and in, in the calibration phase. But it is important to say that this is the first or the last of three presentations. In the first presentation, I gave an overview of the history of our road funding. You no, know, it, it's quite, um, it's astonishing, but, but we don't know what, happened in South Africa historically and where we are now. Uh, we assume that we have this problem right now. We assume we have this problem right now. And, and what happened? How did they solve it historically? You know? Maybe we should turn around and, and look at history and, and you know, there are some solutions there. The second presentation is this relationship between roads and economic development. And the previous uh, gentleman gave, gave us an overview of what roads do. You know, roads, of course, support economic development. Um, and, and that is very important. If we do not have roads, we cannot support economic development. But if we give too much money to roads, then other sectors suffer. If we give too little, you know, we've got this capital asset and we may lose this, this very good capital asset. In fact, if you look at the World Bank and their logistics performance index, roads rank up there as one of South Africa's best assets. Today's presentation is in part about drive, this distance-based road user charge um, experiment we are trying. But I need to give you an intro to the presentation. Um, I think we need to acknowledge uh, South African Road Federation and Sabita that funded you know, our, our research. Uh, the industry recognized that there's a problem. You know, no one is talking about this. In fact, if I ask you to raise your hands, who knows about the current South African road policy and what is, what is the fundamental principle of that policy? You know, what, what does that policy say? I think if, if we're lucky, two or three people will say, I know that there's a roads policy. It's all but four pages long. Um, but no one will tell you exactly what it proposes, um, and, and that, that is a concern. Sarf and Sabita initiated the process, and from there we at Stellenbosch took over, and you know, we've simply exploded with the number of students. There were supposed to be one of our students here today. We've got a big team working on this now at various angles. No? Um, what can we learn from those past presentations? By the way, history. Um, Ironically, not a lot has been done in South Africa since the 1980s. No? We, we did a lot up to then, but so it all went dead quiet. Um, I don't know. Maybe there are a couple of people that say, you know, we, we've done a couple of work, but we need to look at that. There's limited data. There's definitely a lack of knowledge. Maybe there's one or two organizations like Sandral with stacks of information and knowledge, but that's not good if one information sits with all the, the knowledge. No? You, you create friction. Um, and there's confusion between funding and financing. You know, you know, you need capital up front and then you need someone needs to pay for that. Uh, so we've got pieces of information or pieces of policy and then this word the users should pay. No? We've heard it this now. The users should pay. Well, you know, I'll put mine up. I'll gladly pay for, for it. I'll pay for my cell phone. I'll pay for everything. <coughs> Second presentation, there is a relationship between roads and economic development. Yes, but there are four very important requirements. We need an efficient government with very clear policies. You know, this is what we're going to do. Uh, 
we're going to build this infrastructure. It is affordable for the country. This is how it benefits the country. We need a very productive labor source. It's no good you've got roads, but you cannot produce something to use those roads. Technology and systems in modern day logistics, very important. Um, you know, we send part, uh, as part of the World Bank, we assist them and we send out a logistics performance index, some of my colleagues. And ironically, the freight operators, and, and they are here today, argue that we need to look at technology. That's important. That drives down cost. Then we need sufficient funding. You know, if we go and borrow money somewhere, we might just spend ourselves into poverty. Today's presentation, now, of course, we know we should pay for roads. In the correct environment, that will lead to economic development. We all will be happy. Um, the issue is how much and how should we pay? You know, how much should I pay for, for roads? Um, how much, of course, you know, the theory is quite easy. The, the charge should cover my cost. Um, and then if the cost is covered, government can add a tax on top of that. Um, now you've got two different approaches. In the European Union, they load you with tax. No? You are hammered. Norway, they hit you with seven, nine rand per litre of fuel. But ironically, the people in Norway spend much less on transport than South Africans. Um, in the US, they hit you with the minimum of tax. No tax. No, I think it's uh, 48 cents a litre. Um, the problem with too much tax, and that is something we need to be wary of in South Africa. It, it can road uh, development efforts if we pay too much. Overall, the tax burden, and you've heard this is, uh, from uh, Mr. Schuster, yeah, we, we're paying a hell of a lot of tax in this country. Um, it's part of the overall tax we pay. The how? Okay, we've got the fuel levy, we've got the fuel tax. Most countries in the world use the fuel tax. Um, and there's a host of other taxes added to fuel, ne? fuel efficiency, accidents tax, you call it. There's now carbon tax, 12 cents a litre. Um, so fuel use, the, the amount of fuel we use is important in terms of income. Then we can have toll and congestion taxes, charges, very important, very popular. We can have license fees, parking, carbon tire, development contribution, the list goes on and on. And there's roughly 28 <coughs> of them. A hell of a lot of them are used in South Africa. So that's the how much and that's the how. Let's figure it out. Uh, I've showed you this slide. People always ask, but are we highly taxed? Are we not taxed? Uh, that we, is where South Africa was. We moved up a bit. We're in the group of countries that are now called taxed. Um, they refer to that in the discussion as sufficiently taxed. We are moving into the high tax bracket. States is down here, somewhere there. Uh, those are the group of countries that say, we will not tax you on, on road. We assume that you will engage in economic activity and we'll get much bigger, you know, an economic system. And from there, we'll capture the value. We won't tax you on road use. So we are heading in that direction. Um, so how do we collect money? How much do we collect? This, some of you may remember this. Um, it's an, in, in South Africa, 70% of all the government's income from road users comes from the fuel levy. 70% of road users generated license fees a bit. It all went up now. Fines, toll fees, 10%, CO2 emissions. It used to be two, uh, two cents. Uh, it will go up now with the 12 cents. That will deliver an additional 2.5 billion. Um, that is collected at the pump. You know, we all know that story. 2014, it changed a bit from then. It is a massive tax. No? It is four to five, or does, what is it? I can't see there. I've got a problem. It's the fourth biggest tax, no? fourth highest income stream. Do you think government will ring fence the fourth highest income stream? Absolutely no chance of them doing that. Um, it is a very important source of income for, for our government um, after all the other taxes. But maybe, just maybe, we've reached the end of what we can tax people. You know, they call that curve. We are on the on the other side. Ironically, the fuel levy and the fuel tax is suffering because of the other taxes that are imposed on society. Keep that in mind. Some fuel trends, and we've picked that up. You know, there's been there's been a continuous increase in the, the the amount of fuel sold, and then something happened around 2010, 2011. It started flattening off. There's still a growth. In, uh, but it's not that much anymore. Uh, it, uh, and, and we may see an inflection point. Um, vehicles are getting more efficient. Um, people are replacing fuel now, uh, other alternatives. The raise or the increase in the fuel tax has far exceeded inflation, by the way, over the last couple of years. Far. You know? um, that is the inflation line at the bottom, and those are your, your different taxes that that's not a problem. 
South Africa in the fuel tax has kept up with um, inflation, so we can't, can't follow that argument. Um, another brief scenario is, so how do we collect all of this information? That is probably one of the problems in South Africa. It all goes into this big pot. Nothing wrong with that. Some people argue, let's order the fuel levy, let's order the fund. We won't pick up anything there. I think it's quite... Uh, it's, it's adequately maintained. The problem is with the allocation. We'll talk about that. All goes into this big fund. Do not pay too much attention uh, to that. And uh, what I've not included there is development charges, parking levy, tyre levy. It all, I don't know. I still don't know what happened to the tyre levy. And then government allocates it to various departments, etc. And just now they added another tax, uh, tax of 12 cents a litre, uh, a carbon tax, to impose that as well which will deliver an additional revenue. Um, that is the allocation process. Um, let's skip that. Now you try and understand, you go to Treasury and understand the allocation. National Treasury collects all the money except the road accident fund. That is earmarked, by the way. And then it allocates it first to provinces, from provinces to districts, to state-owned entities. And that allocation process is incredibly difficult to unpack and understand. And we still don't understand it. Um, maybe we need to look at improving the efficiency of that, making it transparent to people. Because a lot of the fights are about not having info or knowledge of the information. The fuel efficiency, the problem with the fuel efficiency, it is losing, it is becoming more efficient. And, and this is an animated exercise. But roughly, the growth in efficiency is 1%, 1%. 1.1% per year. So cars are using less and less fuel. No, not, not, of course, every year. And that, is, that has an impact. It, 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 re it results in less income, and, and we need to address that. If we looked at the year 2000, oh no, if we looked at the year 2000 as your reference case, you know, that, that's, that's what it's animated. But it gives you an idea of what's going to happen. That trend, by the way, will only increase. What are the trends due to improved vehicle fuel efficiency, introduction of electrical and hybrid vehicles? Ten years ago, we would have not talked about electrical vehicles. Today, some of us are considering buying an electric vehicle. Stellenbosch University has now 12 charging stations at the university. I cannot plug in my, I cannot plug in my car at the university. Social demographic trend, people are buying less cars, shared economy, shared ownership, ridership, social consciousness, you know. Government under pressure to only charge for use, all of those trends. It's not only us, the, the Americans have picked this up, the Chinese have picked this up, everyone is doing research in this area. Um, and uh, I've showed you this slide, etc. That is one at Old Camry, and you've seen that now we've heard about autonomous vehicles and we've heard about uh, autonomous trucks and electrical trucks, etc. They will not, of course, pay for, for road use because the fuel levy is gone. So, how do you charge them? What can you do? Business as usual is definitely not possible. No? Um, you've seen these adverts. It's in the, the, the news every single day. Um, apparently, Volvo said by the year 2023, I don't know if this is true, but it is, uh, I think it is here somewhere, they will have an electrical vehicle in every single car. Okay, that's fine. But what I did not understand, um, oh, by the way, and the world responded. From 1996, there's been an explosion of studies internationally. Google it. Road funding, international examples. Oh, this is what's happening. There's even a couple of videos that, that we can play. The Australians are now testing it, by the way. Um, but, but that, by the way, is how government co-ops people. They provide information. They do research. They make it available. People read it. They understand the problem. They agree. If government simply does something, you know, then, you know, it's like mushrooms. Um, but this I picked up yesterday in the Financial Times. Um, is it the Financial Times? I don't know. Shell aims to become the world's largest electricity company. Who would have thought about this? You know, these guys have done, I don't know, we've got uh, Mr. Solomons, maybe he can tell us about Shell. And are they are apparently considering this? Well, this was a front page article yesterday. So, and, and the article continues about, they believe they've got a fantastic footprint and they can use that footprint to roll out new electricity. And they are not considering the car business. They are strategic teams. So I don't know. All of this. How much should the user pay? Well, there's a theory. And again, you don't have to go to me. There's a much more intelligent guy, um, uh, Professor Berry at Oxford. 
apply, go and speak to him and he will tell you this, but we can tell you that as well. There are a couple of approaches. The first approach is the road user charge. You look at the difference between freight and the final customer's freight. You charge only for the cost they impose in society. Enough, you don't add load them with taxes now because it's an input cost down the line. People buy less stuff. So you must be careful with, with charging your, your trucks. You must charge them appropriately, by the way. Uh, but then you've got the final customers, and there's no two approaches, non toll and I showed you this. If there's a toll, you do a, a stated preference, um, or if there's an alternative and no alternative. Uh, if there's an alternative, you do the willingness to pay studies. If there's no alternative, uh, also willingness to pay, but then there's a price regulation. You're a monopoly, you regulate the price. Simple as that. Um, on the freight side, you focus on four elements. No? Uh, road damage, the congestion, the environment, accidents, and, and you add that. On the non-toll environment, very similar. Uh, social margin card plus, plus uh, an additional tax element. That, that is the theory. That, that should stand somewhere in a policy, and government should actually quantify that and give us that, that information. And, and I, I, I won't talk about this, but those figures can be unpacked, or those, that, that table can be unpacked, or whatever, flow ground, can be unpacked in something like this. There's a couple of graphs there, a marginal cost curve and an average cost curve. The problem is they are always beneath that line. That line, horizontal line, is your break-even line. They are below them. They are below them. So if you charge the cost to society, you will not make a profit. Um, the components of that road user charge and the one that we implemented in drive, there are they. Infrastructure costs, environmental costs, accident costs, congestion costs. They can be linked to the user and the user should pay for them. Ten minutes left. That is the user pay principle. So bring it on. Government said user pay principle. Yes, I'll, I'll pay. Charge me. Tell me what I need to pay and I will pay uh, that amount. Um, there's a good theory behind this. We can work it. We can determine it for every vehicle, for every road in South Africa. It requires extreme accurate records, and the Europeans and the Americans and the Asians have been doing this time and time and year after year. In fact, they are updating it annually. You can go onto the website, and you can look at any country and in Europe, any road, any time of the day, every region, and it will give you the cost for every type of vehicle, by the way. Um, but tax is so important. You can go to that website. Again, don't believe us. Go to international experts. You can click on the website. What that website tells you, it will tell you, and I should not maybe show you this, your fuel price and the tax of, on your fuel. What is the impact on your economy? If you levy this price, in this country or in this example, we've got three countries uh, and, and you unfortunately cannot see it and neither can I, but one is Uganda, uh, one is Bolivia and I can't remember the other one. So if you implement a tax, this will do it for you online, you just need to calibrate the model from the UN. Um, what is the impact on the G, uh, GDP? And in, in this case, in the case of Uganda, I believe it is, there's a massive negative impact on the GDP. Um, and ultimately, you can use this to determine the optimal fu uh, fuel price for, for your country. Um, and you'll be surprised, we've done the modeling for South Africa. Uh, we collect an insane amount of money from road users in South Africa. Um, not everything is going back to roads, definitely not. But the problem is we collect all of this money from road users. And it's truckers, it is public transport, it's private users, it's all of them. But it's not reflected in the transport cost profile or in the, the, the expenditure profile of individuals. Transport costs in South Africa is the second component in your budget of low-income people. You know, it's, it's shocking, but they spend 23%. This specific lady spends 23% of her income on transport. It is burnt. It is an extremely unproductive expense. So why is that not working through to that? If we, if we, if we've got good roads, and we do have good roads, it's nonsense that we've got poor roads. We've got fantastic roads in this country compared to the rest of, of our infrastructure. And Sunroll is a bloody good organization. They don't do everything right, but they're bloody good. That is the average South African, the average road user. A lot of, lot of cost is imposed on them, a lot of tax. No? The white is what he remained, it remains after you know, he's paid all his taxes and all that. Let's continue. As I said, the, word, the world has done a lot. You can go onto this website, click, 
any road, any car, any vehicle, any time of day for Europe, get your own cost for South Africa. That's what they do. And they deliver the results like this um, in spreadsheet format, in whatever format for their models. And we've taken that and we've converted. Those are the results, for example, for heavy good trucks. Uh, that is in Euro cents uh, 2010 per vehicle kilometers on all roads, motorways, other roads, uh, etc. bigger trucks. We, in fact, we really build the cost of, of roads is largely due to trucks. We've taken that data and we've converted it to South African data. I'm not going to show you using a various couple of techniques and we've played around. We've inflated the values again to animate our results. So we now have European values and it should not, we should not use European values, but there's no data in South Africa. And we've converted it to South Africa values. And, and we've, I've talked about that, uh, what, what we collect from the average road user, we, what we spend, what government is spending, and what the shortfall is to maintain this fantastic asset, this two trillion rand asset. No? We're gonna, we have to maintain it. Um, ironically, there are models available for us to estimate social marginal cost or to estimate cost. It's called the direct measurement, the engineering measurement, uh, and we can use HD4. We've got it in the country. Um, we even have models, as I showed you, to impact, the, to estimate the impact of, of a tax rate. Let me take a look at our neighbour before I get to the tracking. This is our neighbour. This little country, you know, with two million people <laughs> scattered all over. Fantastic road network. Um, they've got a problem, massive problem. Big country, sprawling country, um, 48,000 kilometres, but virtually no one in the country. Now I think they've got. 300,000 cars, so how the hell can they pay for their notes? It's, it's impossible. No? Um, what is even worse is that 61% of all the roads carry less than 50 vehicles per day. You know, do you charge every, and, and you know, less than 1% of the vehicles carry more than 1,500 vehicles per day. We call that a rural road. Huh? <laughs> So how will they fund it? Well, they, they understood, you know, they figured out we've got a problem a couple of years ago um, and they implemented a policy. I'm going to show you that. So what we did, I've got a very good student. Her name is Halfi Petrus. Um, she lives there. Uh, she got all the information and she said, all right, let's try and figure out how much should road users pay in Namibia. By the way, their fuel tax is one rand thirty and the accident tax is 70 cents. No, ours is, I think, in both cases, more than double that. How much should Namibian road users pay? And she applied the model, she came up, this is animated, don't jot this down, this is not correct results. Uh, what you see there is the average cost. That's the cost that they impose. So a four by four vehicle for one kilometer traveling on that specific road that you saw there, the cost to society is only 10 cents. That's the cost. That's the user pay principle. Of course, you can add taxes on top of that. These are rural roads. Eh? In this case, the AADT is, yeah, yeah, that's just over 200. It's nothing. So the cost is, is relatively nothing. That, that's the cost in the Namibian cents per kilometer. So truckers pay a bit, but the rest doesn't pay. This is the marginal cost, which is even worse. This is the economic efficient cost. And, and we can figure it out, you know, that is the cost. If you want to support economic development, you charge people what they cost to society and they will generate business afterwards. What they are paying, and that's the, the price that they are paying roughly in Namibia, made up of the two taxes. Um, I'm only referring to the one uh, Namibian dollars and 30 tax and the 70 cent odd motor vehicle accident tax. That is what they are currently paying. They are paying much more than what they should be paying. The only problem maybe is truckers that are not entirely contributing um, to what they should be paying. So the truckers, the heavy trucks, the articulated trucks, the heavy trucks, maybe the large buses in this case. We've, she's done eight scenarios, so eight different vehicles. All right. But what they have done is they've taken a 15-year approach and a 10-year approach and a five-year approach. They've involved the users. They've involved, they've gone through workshops. They've managed it. They worked it, etc. They workshopped it. They've done it extremely scientific. Everyone is happy. They've got a massive road user forum. They publish these documents every year. That's it. Everyone is happy. They publish it in the newspapers and you don't see anyone complaining. Um, people are involved. All right. 
And now the how, and maybe we need a new approach. We know there's a problem with the fuel levy. Um, what can we do? Keep in mind that there's a couple of trends happening. Eh? One of those trends is government is starting to decentralize. It, it is happening. Maybe provincial government will have a bigger responsibility in the future. They've got very little taxation options. Eh? I don't know. Government, provincial government does not collect a lot. Most of it is of allocations. So the various options that we have is road user levies, vehicles, uh, vehicle use and vehicle ownership levies, parking and uh, loading levies, strip generation levy, commercialization, local tax, etc. But one must be careful with implementing a tax. If you press your hand here, something else will pop out. And you need to, need to follow the correct approach. So we looked at two. We looked at the fuel levy and we looked at a new tax, a distance-based tax. Uh, distance-based road due to charge. And you can read this yourself. There's a problem with the fuel levy. It's getting less and less efficient. Distance-based, we charge you for the exact number of roads that you use. We can implement that. It's fair. We can calibrate it according to your vehicle, according to your time of the day. Why should you pay if you travel midnight? There's no other cars on the road. You're not causing damage. Whether or not you travel or not, there's no cost in society. Why should you pay? Um, and... and uh, the rest of the world responded. There was a very interesting saying this morning, one of the problems we do not have in South Africa is technology. Believe it or not, we are in fact an advanced country when it comes to technology. This is what the rest of the world is doing. In some cases, you have studies like Oregon. By the way, that was the first state in the world, which is actually many country, that implement a, a fuel tax, no? the first. And now they are the first to implement this new tax. And then you've got various other options. This is in, uh, one is in Can no, not, uh, Canada, I think one is in Europe, France, and one is in um, Belgium as well. I don't know if this is true, but everything above 3.5 tons in Europe will need a GPS tracker and they will bill you. Um, but this is important. Citizens are demanding insight, participation, and value for money. Um, so we, we thought, can we, not, can we not replicate this in South Africa? We have the technology. You know, crime is bad, but one good thing about crime is we're tracking everything. <laughs> uh, what the state of Oregon is doing, they've got free service providers, GPS units. They plug in a little GPS unit like that in your car. You can now order it from Amazon. You can order it from the Chinese. We ordered ours, 499 Rand. Plug it in, you get tracked. Nothing, no additional cost. 499 Rand. Uh, then it sends the invoice to your, your smartphone. You can see, this is where I travel today. These are my costs. And they've been sending people invoices like this, and it's been working. They are testing and testing and testing and testing the system. Um, the concept is very, really simple, and this is the concept that we followed. We, we obtained a little GPS tracker that like that. Every single vehicle in the world built after 1996 can be tracked. There is a little dongle, bend down right beneath uh, underneath your steering column, right next to either your parking, not your parking, your, um, uh, yeah, your, your pedals, your, your acceleration, there's a you can, little dongle, exact same dongle, no car in the world will not have that built after 96. So we insert the dongle, it's got a GSM tr uh, chip as well, so it sends, it works, via, it works via the cell phone towers. We track vehicles, we determine their actual vehicle, we can tell you when you traveled, where you traveled, how you traveled, in congested in what specific area, and we work out a charge based on distance of travel, weight of the vehicle, time of the day, location of the travel. Then we create an invoice. On the back of the invoice, I'll show you the values that we've got. On the back of the invoice are the different rates that you should pay for different. Uh, users know via this smartphone the exact charge. Ne? So you get in your car, okay, it's gonna cost me for this type of road, this is the tariff that I'll be paying. And we're trying right now to supplement the fuel levy. If in cases you travel in congestion, you'll be paying more. If you travel in rural areas, you are probably paying too little. And we tell people how to optimize their trips. Tell you a bit more like that. I've heard this morning that why will people not pay for toll roads? Uh, we pay for everything else. The thing is, I get one cell phone bill. One. That's my cost. I don't pay a cell phone levy, I don't pay an annual fund license, I don't pay 666, all these charges. People are just, you know, it's too much. Just make it simple. You can charge them probably more. You can. 
So I paid this invoice, I paid that for it, paid that for an invoice. Why will you not respond to an invoice like that? That is accurate. Um, and that's our system. Right. Log on to the system, tells you you have to register your details, you have to sign a form that you know um, you are willing to share your information. This is extremely important information. We get exact GPS coordinates as well as your smartphone information. We track both, by the way. And off you go. That's it. That's how it looks. Um, and we send you information on the type of roads you use, etc. We looked at different pricing regimes. We looked at your current tax. We've got a couple of pricing regimes in. We looked at your current tax that you pay. Um, we converted that. Uh, we looked at all the taxes, not only your fuel tax and your accident tax. We converted all the taxes that you pay to a liter of fuel. We looked at what Oregon is charging people, a lot less. That is the cents per kilometer. So they are charging people 33.9 cents per kilometer and for diesel less. And we looked at Peter Freeman that did the developed the model way back in the 1980s, the last one, by the way. And he came up with 58 cents. Those are the different vehicles. That's what we charge you. Um, but we also implemented our system. This is what you get on the back of your invoice, all the roads uh, and uh, the type of area that you travel in, if it's free flow condition, near capacity, over capacity. That's the cost. And off we go. Results so far, we get the technology working. There was absolutely no problem with the technology. We've got fantastic tracking firms. Um, we are testing various devices, but they're all pretty much the same. You know, Tracking is, is becoming very good. We can extract accurate information. When we started with it, there was a couple of problems with matching the GPS data. But now it is spot on. It is exactly spot on. We can unpack the exact road. You won't see the person's house on, on this, uh, nor will you see his final destination. But we can get the exact information and road use. We can calculate a road user invoice based on marginal cost. Uh, you've got the lookup table, we generate an invoice, we send you the invoice per time of the day. This is your average. We originally sent it per week, now we send it per month to the 20 people. We continuously track 20 people for three months and then we move on to the next 20 people. And we can send an invoice like this. And off they go. Results so far, we can recover the cost. We've got two electrical vehicles in there. Unfortunately, both are based in Stellenbosch, so they don't travel very far. Uh, we could send them an invoice as well. Um, we picked up, we, we sent some people something in addition. We now, with their permission, we look at their salary per month with uh, their other deduction. So we send them, as part of additional information, we send them information how big your transport exp expenses is compared to your monthly budget. And they get something like this. Um, and people were surprised by, firstly, how much hours they spend in traffic, how far they travel, and then they were surprised about the amount of money, and then they consider alternative options. Uh, we tell them alternative option. By the way, you can half that, you can half that, if you ride share to work in the mornings. And it took people two to three months to say, whoa, maybe I should do this. So ironically, we need to track them, or uh, ideally we need to track them a lot of uh, longer. But there's a whole bunch of other benefits that we obtained. Uh, we don't need origin and destination surveys anymore. I'm going to show you to now. Do we need household surveys? We collect all of this information. This is the results of those 18 pre-pilot people. I, I cannot show you the results of the continuous tracking, and we roughly up to 200 now that, that we've tracked, 218, I think, 219. So when we implemented this, remember their the tariff differs based on the time of day um, the type of road. This is the kilometers that they've driven. This is the fuel levy, how much it delivers. This is the Oregon model, delivers more than us. No? Um, this is the Peter Freeman model, and that is what you should pay if you are paying a congestion tax. This is an inflated amount. No? We've taken the top of what you should pay. That is what our government really should have extracted from those people. Um, 35,000 compared to what the fuel levy delivered is only 7,000. Of course, this you cannot now go and implement this. You need to give people options as well. Uh, and we probably need to calibrate that, that value for South Africa. Uh, the big thing that we did pick up is congestion. 
And again, this is published now daily in the newspaper. Indrex pops up with this. You know, South Africa has got some of the congested cities in the world. You know, of course, the congestion cost is m much, much bigger. In fact, that's where you make your money. Uh, and and we, we, can, we can implement that. It's not that difficult. Um, where the world is looking, I, I got all of these articles within the last day. One, unfortunately, does refer to are, the U, are traffic lock clogged U.S. cities ready for congestion pricing? If the U.S. starts saying that, we need to take uh, attention. They slowly prepare their people. Another one there, uh, citywide trials show how road user charges can reduce traffic jams. But you must be careful. This is not, and I heard that this morning, is not necessarily an income solution. It is a traffic management solution that will have spill-off benefits. No? And then even this guy said, you know, I had that in one of my first presentations, Trump signals he's open to a mileage price because they will not raise their fuel tax. There's no chance that they will do it. It's in their constitution embedded that you don't tax people, you don't tax the final products, you don't tax according to them an intermediate. But he, he wants to look at this. Um, all right, uh, by the way, our government just really uh, released a policy and in that policy they said, um, we need to look at a congestion tax. But how will we pay for fuel tax? So we will pay for a fuel tax, an accident tax, a carbon tax, a toll, and a congestion tax. Yeah, it, it just doesn't make sense. There needs to be one policy document. This is what we do. Okay, collection cost, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna skip this. We at 9%, that is model, that's estimate. It won't tailor at this, no, it, it won't, it probably will increase quite significantly. But those are the collection costs, fuel levy, very, very low admin cost. But remember, the fuel levy may not be with us in the next 10 years. Benefits so far, look at all of that tracking. Do I need origin destination surveys? Do I need traffic flow? Do I need anything? You know, we, we, that is additional benefits we can capture. Th that is the app running. Those are all the roads that people travel. That's all the, we just source all of this information. What do I need in terms of traffic flow theory? Uh, you know, I don't know. Of course, there's a couple of issues. We picked this up. Privacy protection, uh, scalability of systems, difficulty of operations, data security, your equity by income, geograph, vehicle type. All of this needs to be solved and addressed. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, but the likely success factors, and, and maybe, maybe this, is, this is from the states. Maybe we need to look at this. It's understand contentious issues and address them up front. Build trust between the authority the road authority, the taxing authority, and the, the users. We build infrastructure for them. Include choices for participants so they are in control. Tackle privacy head on. Conduct trials and educational reads. Start simple and add on layers. Build a system that's flexible. Test, 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 test. Uh, the Americans have been running with Oregon uh, now f since uh, 2007. We are 11 years down the line. We even ran a public participation exercise. We got extensive results, and we will publish that in the new SATC, where we ask people. We send out a survey. We ask experts, normal people. We got fantastic response. Um, I'm not going to skip this. What we can't, we, I'm going to skip this. What I can tell you is people have got no idea of what they pay, the fuel levy, but they, they want to complain. Uh, but if you ask a person, how much do you pay per litre? Well, they don't know. They've got absolutely no idea. So let's skip the rest. But 95% of the people said, I think we should fund public transport as well with the fuel levy. Um, I don't know. Maybe we need to look at that. Do we involve the public when we plan? All right, let's skip this. Um, I'm going to skip this. My take on findings, this is my last slide. Applying the user pay principle will not lead to sufficient funding in South Africa. As it is applied now in the document, there's a word user pay. It will lead probably to deficits. We need another way. Um, you make your money from congestion, uh, you lose money in rural areas, and the entire system needs to balance. Uh, I think there's enough resources in the system. I just do not understand the allocation. I don't understand where it's going. It, it, it flows through the system, and it's incredibly complex. The problem is not funding. The problem is probably efficiency as well. We need to look at an entirely new road funding approach, complete new road funding approach. It's not a four-page document. It is a document of 200 pages that is built on massive data collection, we deliver something like that. By the way, who represents the industry? It cannot be Sabita and South. Who's the roads forum in South Africa? Who stands up and you know, we represent the truckers, 
you know, what happened to the, the public transport operators? Where are they? I think there's a trust problem. I think road users will pay. I honestly believe people will pay. Um, last slide. This is my last slide. I think we need to establish a road user authority in this country. I think we need to establish a, r a road fund, not ring fenced, just so that we can understand this is the money coming in, this is how it flows. And I think we need a regulator that keeps things out of courts, like you have an electricity regulator. This is the price you charge, this is a fair price, that's to users. That's me. Thank you. You go, you as well stay here. Um, I think all the participants, please come to the front, Olga, um, Paul, Gavin. Um, if we can just sit in front here, I'll take that chair. I'll give everybody a little bit of time. Uh, and you're all welcome to ask questions. I think we're going to send a shoebox or something around for your cards so Harry can give his price away just now while asking questions. But I think more importantly, um, I'd like to just start this question. Uh, I'd like to answer the question. I'm not sure if we have uh, more mics around. Um, so that the people outside of the room can also hear what's going on. It's good to see this sort of uh, a number of people here. But my first question is going to be to every participant. I don't know where Gavin ran away from. Um, what funding do you, the participant in this panel discussion, that's the first and only question I hope to ask, do you favor for roads in South Africa? A fuel tax, a license of vehicles, uh, road tax or distance uh, uh, based, as uh, Professor Kraxman uh, calls it, tolls, combination. But let's just put that into perspective, how much we would need to fund. Um, in South Africa, we heard from the last presentations, uh, I think the first ones, in fact, already, we need two trillion, am I right, in uh, road funding um, for fixing our roads in the next while and assume that we do it in 10 years and we already uh, got maintenance and everything that we've got to do anyway, then I would suggest we're looking at anywhere up to 300 million billion rand to fund. Um, but let's say a minimum in road spending of 150 billion I think would be required under normal circumstances. So, um, whilst you all thinking of your answer there, I'll leave it there. Um, have we organized the mic? Uh, that you can. So, I'll take this mic to the participants, and the other mic is for you guys to ask questions. Because I'm the biggest and fattest in the room, I get to ask the first question. After this, you guys can think about what questions. So, I'll start with Paul, and then you... Sorry. Yeah, I think I alluded in my presentation that uh, in the in the medium to long term, the the mass distance charging is the way to go. If you look at the trends and technology in terms of transport, I think that is. But I mean, right now it would have to be a, a phased approach. So we've got all the existing funding mechanisms, vehicle license fees, as you mentioned, tolls, um, fuel tax. I think it's very important to have a road funding policy or roads policy and a road funding policy, as Stefan alluded to, and then have a way forward. But my feeling is that the, you know, for heavy vehicles, it's a mass distance charge, and then for uh, light motor vehicles, it'd just be a distance charge. Okay. Um, in my opinion, uh, the road tax on distance, especially for the um, uh, private vehicles, uh, in that uh, most of the private most of the privately owned uh, vehicles they park their vehicles to use a uh, public transport and uh, that will also eliminate uh, um, uh, pollution and uh, it will also assist uh, with the congestions that we have especially in the Houghton province however for the truck owners we would appreciate if we would uh, have at least uh, a combination uh, but the amount should uh, be looked uh, uh, very carefully so that it should not be heavily uh, imposed on the uh, truck owners. 
Uh, yeah, that's a difficult question. The, um, I think we are 10 years away from maybe implementing a, you know, a distance-based charge. It takes a lot of uh, technology. So f for the time being, I, I think we need to look at the existing mechanisms. Uh, but we need to look at the allocation of, of funds as well and <coughs> clear up the administration. Uh, a short-term one can, can be um, to look at heavy goods vehicles, uh, but they will probably be needs some quid pro quo, so give and take. Ditto. It's a difficult question, really, and that's, that's what I wanted to say. I mean, which one would we choose? S you know, stealth taxes, fuel levy, distance levy, license permits, taxes are happening currently. Which one would we choose? I suppose the first thing I would say as a consumer is none of the above. Um, the reality is, as I said in my presentation, that you've got to find a system that's not going to, in the first instance, cost a fair amount to collect it. You can't spend a rand to collect two rand. It's got to be as cost um, neutral as possible to collect it. That's an important point. And that's the emotional discussion, whether it's based on sound fact or not, that's happening in this province about ETOLs. Um, so it's got to be as, mus as cost neutral as possible. The next question is, if you're going to go to distances, will all the other current taxes be dropped? Because that's going to be quite a tax. So will the fuel levy drop? And remember, the fuel levy is feeding other things, not just roads. So it's got to be ring-fenced. If you are s charging the so-called users of the roads, then those, the money taken from those users must go to roads. It can't go to something else, arbitrary things called the black hole in the fiscus, for want of a better word. And then it works in other countries because they've got something we don't have, and that's, as they always say in every convention discussion, the elephant sitting in the room. What's the elephant in this room? It's public transport. It's the alternatives. We don't have those alternatives. Now remember, if you start putting charges on to distance usage, it has to be fair for everybody. What will that do to passengers? So if you decide, oh, we won't charge the passengers, you suddenly have this extra levy back onto freight. And remember, at the end of the day, we all pay for that. So it's a very difficult question to answer straight up. There's going to have to be some sort of a transition period. And there's going to have to be, and he used the words, and I can't remember your name, I've got Alzheimer's, so hang on, wait, sure. Prof. Stefan. Um, there's going to have to be quid pro quo and moving on to a new, uh, terrible word regime, type of, of, of funding for the roads. The immutable fact is we're going to have to pay for them. It's going to have to be via the simplest, cheapest method possible. And I cannot stress that more. We've learned a very, very expensive lesson in South Africa for the GFIP. Very expensive. Okay. Well, um, we're going to take questions from the audience. And uh, you're welcome to ask the panel any questions. Just on a, a, a little bit of a thought process, though. If we had to spend just $150 billion on roads and public transport which would be about a doubling, would you agree, what we're spending right now? Uh, doubling would be about 160 or 170 billion, I think. Um, but it will be more than right now. Then, uh, if you finance that through the fuel levy alone, 22 billion litres of fuel are sold in South Africa. Some of that goes via ESCOM, some of that via Transnet, who are not going to pay the, for the toll, for the roads and, the, and stuff like that then you're basically going to have to live with a fuel tax, probably about double, if not two and a half times at least, uh, what it is now. So you take the fuel tax from about 3 Rand 15 on petrol, for, for example, and it'll be about 7 Rand 50. That's excluding then the RAF, because the RAF is an accident fund. Just a thought. Any questions? Well, let me get up. Let me see you all. Anybody got any questions on road funding? Anybody got a question to any one of the audiences? Here we go, Jim. Jim, just identify yourself. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jim Campbell. Question to Stefan. Uh, in terms of your proposed road user tax, 
Who would the invoice be sent to? The vehicle registered owner, a company? How would that work? How would we know that the cost would go to the right payee, if that makes sense? That's what we're trying to figure out. Currently, it goes to the owner of the vehicle. We pre-select people uh, that are the owners of the vehicle, and, and we tax them. The way the state does it, if you do not pay your tax, uh, every vehicle is registered. You, uh, Oregon, for example, and if you go for your annual license and registration, they verify that your tax is paid. So there is, cross, there is checks and balances. But it is a problem, of course. How do you do with rental cars, etc.? Um, if you're not the owner of the car, currently it goes to the owner of the car. If the car is registered in your name, the license, it is sent to that, that individual. Where does Sol send your uh, thing to? Sorry? Where does, uh, I need your address for, for SARS. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I, I've got a number of vehicles, as other people may have. Now, would each of those vehicles have to be registered with this payee system, even though I can only drive one at a time, and I don't do a lot of mileage anymore with very small costs, but would it still go ahead that, that those each and every vehicle would be logged into the system, and when it goes on the road, then I would pay something. And just to ride it whilst I've got the microphone, if I may, do you foresee that the road user charge system would cover the costs of the Sanrel's uh, uh, highway system around here, would that cost be written off then? So you could go on the Sanrel road without any further costs. It would come out of that road user charge. Thank you. you know, uh, yeah, remember, this is, uh, we're doing a trial, uh, and, and we are looking what the Europeans are doing. They, uh, the French are full of toll roads, but they are still one of the systems that I showed are... Is, uh, One of the systems that I showed is a French system, and all the trucks um, crisscrossing France will have a GPS uh, unit, and they, they taper it. Now, as soon as you are on the toll road, you can switch it off. Th the thing is, you have the exact locations of that car, so if you enter the toll road, it becomes possible to say, all right, we drop the tax, and now you are paying a toll. Uh, as you if, uh, off, uh, uh, leave the system, it starts working out uh, your, your system again. So it is possible to do uh, the algorithms and implement that. Um, we've got, we've got. In fact, TomTom Tom has got all the data on all the roads in South Africa, uh, and it is quite possible to do that. We have not run into a single problem uh, yet. On the technology side, everything is available. Uh, on the administration side, to allocate the, the the fees, to extract the toll fees, to extract parking charges if you stand still, for example to extract a congestion tax. It is even possible to say, well, we only activate your charge if you enter a certain region, if you enter the city, and then you start paying. And for the rest, rural roads you don't pay, at night times you don't pay, wherever you travel, you only pay certain. So w currently we are trying to find exactly the problems that, that, that you mentioned. All right, any other questions? We'll have to take the mic to you and then take the mic back. So just be patient with us. We're a one mic organization. There's only me. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Lesehon Zima. Um, I just want to maybe share some thought that I'm having right now. Currently, I feel like everybody's looking at how much it costs to milk a cow but nobody's looking at how much does the cow bring in. We all know that we're paying levies, but what are the levies really doing and how much, are, how much is government getting from that as a figure to actually find out that how are they managing the funds towards, the incre towards bettering the roads and everything. Maybe the problem might not be that we are paying too much, but maybe we're not managing the money correctly. I just wanna find out what you guys have to say about that. As far as I remember, I recall from Lowe's presentation, it was 59 billion for um, the actual road network in South Africa this year. But anyway. The global figure that is generated by the fuel levy is known. 
one of the, the questions has been, and we took it to the, to the president at, at the then president, President McClante, when ETOLS was being rolled out. We took to him a couple of important, interesting facts where provinces get an allocation to deal with their roads and they don't spend that money on roads. They spend it on something else. So that's where the first problem is. There were provinces that gave their road allocation funds back to Treasury at the end of the year because they didn't spend it. So that formed a huge discussion at one stage is how the money generated by the user specifically for roads was being managed. It's a very good point you've got. Very, very important point. What is currently happening in policy is that the Department of Transport has has tabled a draft bill called the economic, uh, the Single Transport Economic Regulator, commonly called the STIR bill. It's now changed its name again. It's now just called the Transport Economic Regulator. And it, one of its functions, one of its functions, is to try and ascertain how the money is being spent and is being spent correctly, and that the levies being charged by the various state-owned entities um, are, are just and valid and are supported. One of those entities is Sanrail. I see a lot of problems in, in that bill, but it's a very, very, very important point that you've raised. Yeah, I think uh, just to add to what Gavin has said, uh, the ring fencing of roads is, is is basically a decision made by National Treasury. So that, was, that decision was made some years ago. So all taxes generated by the sale of alcohol do not go to alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever. All cigarettes, taxes from cigarettes don't go to you know, hospitals for lung cancer treatment. That was their, that's their argument. So all the money generated from fuel taxes goes into the pot. The, the, the advantage of toll fees is that that money, the money generated from tolls by N3TC track, that is definitely for, for roads. Um, I think your, I, I agree with Gavin. This is, it's a very, very important point. Um, I had a meeting with a, it's a vice president of Volvo India a few weeks ago, and he was telling me about the I don't know what the name is in India. It's an economic one, the economic regulator for the country. And they've got a target to reduce their logistics costs from 14% to 10% of GDP by the end of next year, end of 2020. They're busy currently building, on average, 30 kilometers of new road every day. That's the, the roads projects they've got in India. And they're looking at a whole lot of new regulations for heavy vehicles to try and reduce costs. So I think <laughs> there's a country I see that's taking transport very, very seriously and they see it as being a very important part of the economy. And I think your question is probably directed at that sort of, we need to take this very seriously for the, for the economy of the country. Um, the question the gentleman has raised is quite valid. And uh, I would like to support you on that, in that uh, even the Department of Transport, I'm not uh, representing the Department of Transport, but we had discussions with them. Uh, there's an apparently the bill uh, that is uh, being gazetted, and uh, participation is quite uh, uh, important for all of us to, to, to take part in that. Uh, for example, where they are talking about uh, the dismissing or the, the, the dropping off of the fuel levy. So please uh, just go on to your uh, Department of Transport website and uh, check the bill and indicate whatever is uh, required so that we will be able to, to contribute uh, effectively. All right. Um, there's just a thought I would like to point out that it's not only the national government and the provincial government, but when you pay property taxes, you're also paying to a local government, and some of those property taxes are supposed to be used for suburban roads anyway. Um, but having said all that, the fuel tax in itself is not enough to fund South Africa's roads at the moment, there's no doubt. And you can add the license fees and the toll fees and everything. And I think partly, um, not sure where they found the money, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the non-spending of the provinces 
is now being channeled back to Sanrol, and that's where they got the five billion that they announced just the other day. Anyway, anybody else with a question? We're now back to two mics. I doubled in size. Good day, gentlemen. My name is Rita. I'm from HFO Schaefer for Food. I just wanted to ask you guys, um, Professor Kraxman, in your representation, you gave us a representation of individuals up to which levels they are taxed. It was quite a, something that stuck with me. So how are we going to fund the roads and promote economic development and <laughs> provide that, that environment for the SMMEs to grow if, in my opinion, sometimes there's so many taxes that we are paying, is it going to be feasible to keep paying all those taxes and add a road user charge, or would a single uniform road user charge be possible? Yeah, I think the best person to ask uh, would be Mike, but uh, listen, this tax that I'm referring to replaces the other taxes. It's not an additional tax. Uh, I think ultimately we need to work uh, towards that. Just out of interest, one needs to understand that if you tax someone, uh, less money is available to spend in the economy. You transfer money from the private sector to the government sector, and you hope that the government sector is more productive than the private sector. In the government also now takes you know, care of, of your public infrastructure. But everything that government does should be either to stimulate economic development, ensure safety, and redistribute wealth. They've got no other function. It's those are their three functions, and that's where they should collect tax. One of their functions is to stimulate economic development. But you can tax yourself into poverty. And we must be careful not that, that we haven't now reached the phase where th the spending money that's available is, is too little. You know, and and we, we can cause a, a problem. You know, one of the benefits of transport is to lower the cost between origin and destination. If you add tax, you increase the cost. Uh, and, and it needs to be the perfect tax. And, and that model that I showed for the UN, you can in fact go and model the perfect tax for South Africa. I'm not going to show you because the answer is is not what, what one wants to see. <laughs> but you can look at that. I saw the answer. I have to have all your cars now. You haven't got the money. <laughs> um, the last question, and then we're going to wrap up. I think Harry wants to give away a surprise. The person in the blue there. Thank you. My name is Sivuile Lama. Um, what I see as an immediate challenge, more than just uh, paying for the roads, the biggest construction companies in South Africa are going under. Uh, it's said Central is not here. But my worry is, do we have the skill set to continue maintaining the roads? We do not have a vehicle manufacturer that is South African. So we don't have IP of dropping the cost of manufacturing vehicles. I appreciate what uh, Dr. Paul is saying about India. But for an, as an example, South Africa is lagging behind in bus construction because economically it doesn't make sense for companies to adapt to current technology, which is back engine buses. And because of economics, South Africa is now lagging behind, whether it's engines, it's very few companies in South Africa that have Euro 6 engines. So going forward, what I envisage, I see a bleak future. I don't know if i um, off the tangent, um, but I, I don't know if what do you think of wha my views. Thank you. Well, I'll, ans I'll respond uh, with regards to roads. Um, probably Gavin is maybe better in a better position to respond with regards heavy vehicles, but there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that we have to retain road construction technology and quality. I mean, I yesterday I told you I was driving back and they're just finishing off the construction or the doubling of the N1 between Kruenstadt and Fentersburg. And I mean, you see that, that equipment that's working there to get that road smooth, it's got to last for 20 years at least, and it's a lot of money. It's, I don't know, 50 kilometers of double highway. That's a lot of money, that's a lot of investment. And if you don't do it properly and the road starts packing up in five years' time, you're in serious trouble. You're in serious trouble in terms of reconstruction costs and vehicle operating costs. So 
I have no, and I'm, it's a it's a challenge between you know getting the emerging operators on board. That's uh, not operators, emerging contractors. We have to push that, but at the same time, we can't afford to lose the the quality. I've driven on some roads in the Free State where they've done some repair work on maybe two kilometres, and it is the the quality of the <laughs> it's like someone's come in there with a, a rake and sort of like. <laughs> You can't drive on that thing at, at 80 kilometers an hour, you know, it's, it's just, it's terrible. So the building roads requires a lot of expertise and it's, you know, it's not, it's about the efficiency of the economy that's, it's important. So uh, it's, you've got a valid point and I don't know what the answer is though. It's, it's a challenge. Valid point you have uh, indeed. Um, yesterday I was uh, attending the skills uh, development or skills transfer summit in uh, uh, CSIR and uh, one of the questions which was raised uh, on the construction and the transport and logistics uh, uh, sectors was that of the skills transfer. So um, there are uh, uh, um, processes in place uh, to transfer the skill uh, and uh, also to ensure that uh, we retain uh, our roads as uh, effective or efficient as possible and also the skills from the construction side uh, as uh, we have indicated. Yeah, the, the question you raise is, is again, it's, it's not easy to answer. And some of the things Paul has said is, is plays into this mix. I think What's happening here is a thing that you'll hear quite often. It's disruptors that are, that are playing in this space. And one of the biggest disruptors is a thing called technology. I just want to see a show of hands. How many of you have the Samsung S10? Of you have the new Samsung S10 phone? All right, how many of you have a Samsung S9? Or the equivalent iPhone? So the latest technology, how many of you have it? How many of you have a phone that only f makes calls and does SMSs? That's all it does. Can't do WhatsApp, can't go into the internet. So it's a 2G phone. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sure you can do WhatsApp and what have you on there. Um, don't worry, Harry's handing them out afterwards if you'd like. Them. <laughs> the S10 has just been launched. And Samsung has already said in four months' time the, the Samsung X will be, will be on the market, which can fold in half. It can also project a holographic keyboard. Disruptors like that make it very difficult to play in a space and develop things as you see technologies leaping. And when I was a kid, which was yesterday, you know, Technology changed every sort of 10, 15 years. And there's some gentlemen sitting here, obviously no ladies, the technology changed every 30 years. Now it's changing every two and a half years in terms of technology. So building of roads. I told you I spent some time in the States. We've got far better roads on average than what are in the United States. There are a couple of nice roads, but in general, if you compare the provincial roads and Paul will bear me out on this. In general, our provincial roads are at a better standard than they are. Yeah, there are some really bad provincial roads that we have. So what do we do? How do we fix this? Why are the companies closing? Well, for one reason, there's the collusion ghost. The 2010 is hitting a couple of big companies in terms of building those stadia. So there's something else happening. But in terms of road maintenance, we've got very, very good companies. We're the only country in the world we more than 80% of our road network is bitumen. It's expensive. We're the leaders in technology in bitumen pavement. Is that the right term? I'm not swearing, eh? Okay. Okay. Where we've taken what used to be a brick standing on its end down to a quarter of that size. And, you know, Sanwell, the engineers will tell you. So we're not doing too badly, sir. But there's a lot to be fixed. Now we go to vehicles. And if we want to improve efficiency on vehicles and emissions and all those nice green things, this whole debate around Euro 2, Euro 3, Euro 4, Euro 5, Euro 6 starts coming in. We don't have the fuel to run Euro 5 vehicles. Our fuel's not clean enough. And to get clean fuel, we have two options. We either buy it in, 
So that price you're adding for fuel as tax is going to go up when we've got to pay twice as much for the clean fuel. Or we've got to fix our refineries and they're not interested. So we kind of caught in a cycle. So I was saying to someone at lunch, the pressure here is to go to electric vehicles. That's the pressure because it's going to, we're going to then leapfrog all the problems we've got. And as soon as we go to electric vehicles, and it'll take some time, bang goes your fuel levy. Because that's really where we're heading for. So the other question that you're going to see happening in Norway, they've brought in electric vehicles. What has it done? It's killed the supportive industries because on a diesel vehicle, you have 4,600 odd parts. On an electric vehicle, you've got 301. No oil filters, no air filters. No s Diesels don't have spark plugs, I'm just checking. Um, fan belts, all that type of thing is gone. So the whole industry behind transport that generates tax that comes into the system goes. So we've got, we've got to be careful about these disruptors. What I'm saying to you is, the discussion today was how are we going to pay for roads. We've got to look at it. And the reality is that the fuel levy is not the silver bullet. Somewhere down the line, that fuel levy is going to really drop down. What, what we're saying is operators, make it fair, make it simple, make it as cheap as possible to collect. I think I'll give the last word to the professor because we're running over time. If you want to say something and then... Um, I think the last speaker, you ask a very interesting question. It's in the transport sector's DNA, by the way, to shed jobs. The 1960s, everyone worked in a port. Then they implemented a container. Now, do yourself a favor. I'm Dutch. Go to Rotterdam. There's not a single person working there. So the transport sector, in its involvement, shed jobs. And you cannot, you cannot stay behind. So I, we use this word disrupting technology, but it's, it's just, it, it happens. It is a slow new development. The trick is, and that was my second presentation, you, your government needs to identify those trends and Educate your labour to fulfil new needs. The transport sector does shed a lot of jobs and it will bleed jobs in the next couple of years. Autonomous drive, electrical vehicles, drone deliveries, etc. That should bring down the transport costs significantly. More money for people in their pocket to produce or to buy stuff. So you better make those, train those people to manufacture those stuff. Uh, but it will also put pressure on the traditional income sources. And, and we're seeing that now. You know, municipalities are losing uh, the battle to uh, sell electricity. People are now moving off the grid. I will move off the grid in five years' time. I will not pay an electricity fee. But that's a big income for municipalities. So technology also changed the traditional income sources. And you have to adapt. The Americans aren't worried about technology. Their tax is minute. They can't care less. Uh, but they are adapting and planning for the future when they will implement a new tax. So there's nothing wrong with technology, but it is very important that you plan and you get your labour up to a productive standard to accommodate that. Another problem with the transport sector, not a problem, it opens up your markets. No? Accessibility opens up South Africa for international competition. Nothing wrong with that. But that means we can manufacture anywhere else in the world, lower the production cost, bring it in. We better be you know, prepared in, in order to, to export. Um, and I think there's only one way, and, and that is to compete internationally. We have to, to, have to really focus on labour productivity. We thank you all for coming. I don't know what Harry wants to do, but uh, I think I should just answer Gavin on one thing about electric cars. One word, ESCOM. <laughs> um, well, it, it, it's quite clear we're not going to have the electricity to plug into, but um, we're going to have a competition now, and Harry, how are we going to collect the cards? Thank you very much, Mike. Ladies and gents, let's give Mike and our panel a good hand. <laughs> this is now when we're going to say goodbye to our online viewers. Thank you very much for uh, following us online. The next transport forum is on the 4th of April in Durban with Transnet Port Terminals. It's all about collaboration and integration in South African ports. Um, that event will also be live streamed.
Thank you very much for following us and goodbye.